All right, welcome back everybody to session two. Um, so this session is titled Developing Trustworthy AI-Informed Weather Forecast for End Users, moderated by myself, Elizabeth Barnes, or Libby, um, professor at Colorado State University, and um, Amy will introduce herself um, in the next panel. Uh, so this two-part session will focus on developing trustworthy forecasts for different end users. So the first panel um, will focus on how AI can and will be utilized to enhance forecast capabilities. And just to remind people about the format, the format's a little different for every session and for every panel. So each speaker, um, we've invited them to give seven minutes of prepared remarks. Um, and we'll, and for the speakers, um, Rachel's gonna give you a two minute, uh, a warning when you have two minutes remaining. Um, and then Amy and I will be the mean the mean ones who sort of, you know, remind you of the time if it goes too long. Um, and then there'll be 20 minutes of Q&A after this very first panel. So all, after all speakers make their remarks, which is different than the last the last session. Um, and then just as a reminder, uh, please submit all questions for the speakers via Slido. So with that, we'll get started on panel one. Um, we have three great panelists to talk about focusing on utilizing AI tools to enhance forecast capabilities. And I want to introduce Chris Karstens, he's a techniques development meteorologist in the Storm Prediction Center at NOAA's National Weather Service. So take it away, Chris. All right. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, welcome. And um, Chris, we lost your video, by the way. Oh, there we go. Get it back up. Hey, everybody. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, today I'm going to talk about. Um, the development of AI ML based forecasting guidance at the Storm Prediction Center. And uh, as mentioned, I'm a uh, techniques development meteorologist here. So I do a lot of R2O work here at SBC. Uh, next slide. OK, so what is the Storm Prediction Center? I just want to give a brief background on kind of what we are. Um, we And this statement here is, is actually pulled directly from our station duty manual. Um, the SPC is the National Center of Expertise for Forecasting Mesoscale Hazardous Weather uh, in the in the in the National Weather Service, including uh, economically disruptive weather events such as tornadoes, large hail, damaging winds, and significant weather uh, winter and fire weather. Um, the main kind of like you know subsection of this statement that I want to focus on is the National Center of Expertise. So you know we we really think of ourselves as the experts, and so this is kind of an important backdrop I think to kind of this whole AI ML you know, emergences happen, you know, we want to also be the experts in that as well when it comes to forecasting these types of things. On the right side, you see just a, a screen capture of our website um, and 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 the link to, to our publicly available website there, um, just show, showcasing some of the products that we issue here. All right, next slide. You know, so why, why use AI ML at SPC? Well, you know, SPC has a long history of developing what we would consider traditional post-processing tools to aid in a variety of forecasting applications relevant to our mission. Um, I've listed out a few of these. I probably don't have too much time to really go into them. But the one thing I do want to mention um, is that uh, these are publicly available again on the website um, that we have. Um, and really, these are, are focused on you know, trying to create the best state of the atmosphere and running a bunch of uh, you know, post-processing tools, diagnostics, things of this nature to, that we have found helpful in aiding our forecasting of, of high impact weather. Um, really, there's probably just too much to show here, uh, but just kind of, you know, as a backdrop again, um, we've had a long history of this. And so obviously, you know, speaking to the choir here, AIML techniques have demonstrated improvements over, you know, traditional statistical approaches across multiple domains. Um, you know, and and so obviously this is something that that we are going you know, to venture into as well. So, you know, how do we transition uh, into this new paradigm? And, you know, I've got some bullet points here, you know, learn, form collaborations, co-develop tools, and then transition those into operations. You know, I don't think there's really anything, you know, too special or out of the ordinary here. This is really kind of the guiding principles that I think we've always had at SPC and really ties into uh, one of our our great um, you know annual uh, experiments that we do with the community called the hazardous weather test bed. And I've got a slide later that that talks about that. So so really it's kind of the, the same old formula, but but um, you know the process the process is the same, um, and and just you know working through that process to usher in this this new paradigm. 
And I think that the process of doing that then builds trust. So next slide. So I wanna showcase some of the early um, AI ML based tools that we have developed at SPC. Uh, along the top row, I have what are kind of our main uh, products that we issue. So convective outlooks, which transition and meso mesoscale discussions. And then that transitions into our convective watches. So severe and thunderstorm, uh, severe thunderstorm tornado, uh, tornado watches for the entire country. Um, and so below that, we have some of, some of this guidance. So the first one, the upper left, this is a, a, a form of guidance that developed uh, at uh, Colorado State. And uh, actually, uh, as of Friday last week, this was transitioned formally into operations. So this is running on on NOAA's supercomputer as of last Friday. So it's, it's completed the R2O transition, if you will. Um, below that are a few other uh, AI ML ba based techniques. These are more for day one, day two convective outlooks. So that shown there are probabilities for tornado within 25 miles of a point. Um, and we have traditional methods for these, but here you see obviously some AI ML based methods. Um, if we move on to mesoscale discussions, this one's kind of tricky, you know, this, this is, within a, a smaller time and space scale than, than we see on the convective outlooks. Um, so not really much has been done here, but we have a planned project for this starting in the fall. And then on the right side, we have actually some new guidance for convective watches. So here you see in the yellow watch, the suggested watch placement for the day um, relative to those uh, parallelograms which show the actual watches issued by SPC. And then recently yeah, this has me. been uh, transition into uh, watch types, so we we can uh, see whether or not you know tornado or severe, and making that decision. And then finally, we have you know for verification, um, you see these uh, blue squares on the map. These are wind damage reports uh, as well as wind uh, you know wind measurements exceeding fifty knots. There's kind of a mix, um, but um, the wind damage can sometimes occur with winds that are less than 50 knots. Um, and so we want to be able to distill out what, you know, what is resulting from 50 knots or greater versus uh, winds that are less than that. So, um, so, and that's important for our verification of our convective outlooks back on the, the left side there. So, so we have some AI ML based techniques that we're running on that, but just to kind of circle back to the middle here, this is all, you know, within R2O. And we're using really kind of an all the above approach uh, with academic partnerships, cross disciplinary research, our uh, cooperative institute uh, here at OU, um, NOAA OAR, of course, like NSSL, our partners at the National Severe Storms Laboratory here in Norman, and as well as um, internal uh, NWS and SPC uh, projects. So next slide. I do want to touch briefly on uh, thunder and fire weather, um, as this is uh, another important aspect of what we forecast, and we've done some work here related to lightning density. Um, so it's kind of hard to see. There is a, a, a brown dashed line. That's our um, isolated dry thunderstorm outlook for for a particular day, and you're seeing here uh, the AIML lightning density tool uh, highlighting higher probabilities of, of, uh, higher concentrations of lightning, uh, and so lightning density. So, so good correlations there, uh, relative to, you know, the actual outlook issued on the right side, we have fire currents. Fire currents isn't something we, we, uh, predict explicitly at SPC. We are more fire weather, but this is something, I think a tool that can obviously be very helpful, uh, when we are engaging with our partners in the fire weather community. Um, so it's just another form of, of AI and ML that's being applied uh, within SPC. Next slide. Okay, so the last slide I've got uh, touches on the NOAA hazardous weather test bed. Um, the image here could actually be taken from today because uh, this is actually happening right now. Um, but of course, this image is uh, taken from, from last year. But, but um, you know, this is an annual uh, forecasting experiment held each spring. Uh, where we kind of test out the latest and greatest tools uh, being developed across the entire weather enterprise, not just, you know, within the government itself, but uh, academia, uh, OAR, um, and the private sector as well. So um, here I've got, you know, a list of various things uh, being tested this year in the hazardous weather test bed. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not going to touch on these specifically, but I think I just want to note that, you know, we've seen this grow every single year. Uh, this is, is really kind of just 
continue emerging thing here um, as we, you know, we've had a long tradition of uh, NWP ensembles, things of that nature being evaluated. And we're seeing more and more uh, all these AI and ML based techniques uh, emerging and being evaluated. So we should have some pretty exciting results here in the next few months as uh, uh, the results are tabulated and, and shared uh, publicly. So uh, I think I've got one additional uh, thing if you click forward. Just want to showcase. All right, and Chris, we're we're past yes. um, seven minutes here, so maybe okay. try to wrap it up. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> oh, is this you wrapping it up? Wow. Oh, sure. That yeah, I can I can talk briefly. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is uh, just uh, just one of the tools being tested. This is what we call our impacts model. So we're taking our convective outlook and and blending it with various census data, as well as historic tornado data, and coming up with simulated tornado counts probabilities of intensity, um, recurrence rates, and even uh, predict a number of casualties. So, um, you know, some AI and ML is being applied here uh, for this task. And uh, hopefully this is something, you know, we can see in the next few years uh, when we, uh, especially for our partners like FEMA and Red Cross. So I'll wrap it up there. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And great examples again of, of sort of this um, uncertainty quantification piece. All right, so our next, let me introduce our next spe speaker, our panelist, um, Jason Levitt. Actually, before I do that, just a reminder to everybody, unlike the last um, panel, we're gonna have all of our panelists speak and then we will open it up for, for a good 20 minutes of Q&A. So go ahead and put your questions in Slido and they will be safe there until we've heard from everyone. Okay, so um, our next um, speaker is Jason Levitt. So Jason Levitt is the Chief of the Verification Product Generation and Product Generation Branch at the NOAA Environmental Take it away, Jason, thank you. Okay, thanks, good afternoon. Thanks for allowing me to participate in this uh, panel discussion and this presentation here this afternoon. So I'll be talking about uh, developing trustworthy AI in our uh, weather forecasts uh, here from EMC and the, the data that we send from the Environmental Modeling Center from our models and that's model post-processing and also our verification system. Next slide, please. So as a lot of you know, uh, we are uh, transitioning a lot of our standalone application, 21 independent standalone systems that you see on the left over to uh, the Unified Forecast System applications. And within that, uh, there's a whole lot of AIML things sprinkled in uh, here and there in terms of uh, uh, various efforts that have occurred uh, to do that over the, the, the course of the past uh, 20 years or so. One of the things I wanted to highlight in terms of post-processing, which I'll be talking about today, is within the HER, we have Hailcast, which uses AIML that uh, uh, the Severe Storms Lab developed and uh, uses uh, AIML to, uh, to, to fit uh, hail data uh, to the, the forecast data that's coming out of the HER. So that's just one example. Uh, but there's lots of opportunities here uh, to inject and invest in uh, various AIML techniques for post-processing as we transition over to UFS applications. So what you see on the left, which was all of our different standalone systems, we're trying to consolidate, uh, bring those number of applications down that makes it easier to maintain, uh, makes it easier for us to work with our partners in, 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 uh, in uh, increasing the skill of those models as we move forward throughout the years. Next slide, please. So just in terms of what we're doing here in, in our product system, so you know, within the post-processing and product generation branch, uh, we have a staff that will develop all of the techniques and tools to extract out data from the native model grids, from things like the GFS and the GEFs, and then do uh, value added and derived products from those that come out into the grid files and at CDF files that you see on Nomads or that you download from any other uh, third party vendors, for example, in, in terms of uh, the data that we, we produce in terms of raw data and then create the value added data. Uh, in terms of the product systems that this branch is responsible for, things like the North American Ensemble Forecast System, NAFES, we have a combined wave ensemble, we have a time-lagged uh, rapid refresh ensemble called NARI-TL, we have these uh, vortex trackers for uh, ensemble tracking around the globe, and then an extra-optical cyclone tracker, uh, precipitation analysis, uh, two different precipitation analysis systems, and our uh, world area forecast system, which is uh, a, a product which is for aviation. Uh, you can see sprinkled in all of these are bits and pieces of AIML in some form of maturity or not. Uh, in terms of our ensemble systems, we have some basic bias correction uh, that we do that can be considered AIML, uh, except uh, bias correction and calibration are, are under that realm. So we do that for the guests, for the FIDMOC data, and then for the NAFES as well too. 
Uh, in terms of our uh, vortex tracking, so some of those vortex trackers are used internally for verification purposes. I'll talk a little bit about that. And we're looking at potentially using some AIML techniques for vortex tracking, uh, the very uh, early exploratory stages in terms of, of looking at that and how we might be able to train an algorithm to recognize uh, extratropical cyclone or tropical cyclone to help us verify our hurricane models and also potentially even as output as well too, um, in terms of a, a new type of output. Um, uh, CCPA, our uh, calibrated precipitation analysis, that has bias correction and calibration in and of as well too. It uses a, a climatology of precipitation products to calibrate that and to, uh, to correct um, uh, issues and errors associated with the output from that. And then our world area forecast systems or aviation products, uh, in-flight icing and turbulence both use AML techniques, uh, especially turbulence uh, with our partners at NCAR that develop that algorithm. So lots of things going on in the post-processing realm and lots of opportunities for maturity and for using a lot of the new and emerging techniques that are coming out. Next slide, please. So AIML uses, so uh, mathematical techniques for these in AIML have been around for decades, really, in meteorology, we think about it. Uh, model Output Statistics, or MOS, which uh, I think a lot of you have heard of, was started in the early 1970s. Uh, linear regression, multiple linear regression, those can be considered under the umbrella of AML, AML mathematics. National blended models have been going on for, for quite a while now, too. Um, that's also an AIML technique, and they're thinking about upgrading those systems, too. More opportunities are now uh, available to us, which is why a lot of these uh, these types of meetings like we're having today are now taking place. Uh, now we have matured mathematics with AIML math, more computational power with GPUs and just CPUs and supercomputers in, in general, lots of opportunities. But as we're seeing behind the scenes here, especially here at EMC, it's not a silver bullet. So maybe some of the things that we can start thinking about in terms of post-processing techniques that might be low-hanging mm -hmm. fruit and the community has kind of identified target finding extremes and forecast correcting shifts of tails. Uh, these are things I think would be very useful for forecasters, especially finding extremes and forecasts that maybe you wouldn't be able to, to see normally, uh, which is regular techniques and improvements to our bias correction and calibration processes as well, too, uh, because some of them are are uh, can be matured uh, with uh, with some of the growing knowledge in that math. Next slide, please. Just real quickly in terms of verifying this, making this trustworthy. So we developed here at EMC our new EVS, our EMC verification system. It's a real-time system for our operational products, uh, operational uh, models and product systems. It's essentially why well, you see the microscope and a picture of CERN there. It's our, our tool for curiosity and discovery for finding systematic errors and biases in the models. And this could be applied to and is being applied to some of the data-driven models that EMC is developing and working on as well. It's basically a tool for quality control. And it was implemented just a few weeks ago on March 26th. So it is running on WCOS uh, and our supercomputer um, today and producing images at the website that's linked on the slide. Next slide, please. EVS statistics, so this generates about 900,000 images per day, 325 variables measured across a production suite. Uh, so there are opportunities here to not only use EVS, and we are right now, like I said, for some of the data-driven models that we're testing, but also for other techniques as well, too. And I'll get to that right now in terms of the next slide. Next slide, please. So uh, here on the last slide that I have to wrap up, uh, AIML uses and verification. So Things like our process-oriented metrics that we're thinking about moving towards out of the standard things like RMSE and uh, equitable threat score, things like that, to process-oriented, how will do models uh, say handle uh, the evolution of dry lines and, and supercell structures? Uh, how well do the models handle uh, fronts and cyclones uh, in terms of object-oriented metrics? How could we potentially train an algorithm to identify a particular environment that we would like to measure the model being able to forecast against rather than just standard statistics is there some more in-depth knowledge that we can create from some more maturing of the mathematics that we use to verify models and AIML might be able to help with that. Um, additional metrics we haven't even thought of uh, with research and, uh, and thinking about how we might be able to apply some of these. Maybe there's uh, new things out there that we haven't discovered yet. And also for observation gap filling, uh, especially where there are uh, moving uh, observations, we think of aircraft, uh, potentially with, with TAMDAR and AMDAR data. Maybe there's a potential for AIML to do observation gap filling, especially in data sparse regions, uh, like across mountainous regions or over oceans, where we would be able to then verify the models better using observation gap filled data sets. And uh, next slide, I think that will conclude. But yeah, that's right. So uh, thank you for allowing me to participate today and look forward to our panel discussion. Thank you, Jason. Um... Okay, so our final panelist uh, is Tom Hamill. Tom is the head of innovation at the Weather Company. 
And so Tom, go for it. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna confine my focus here in today's brief discussion on deep learning numerical weather prediction. I realize there's lots of applications of AI throughout the forecast process. And I put up this provocative quote um, that I liked from a recent book I read. People worry that computers will get too smart and take over the world, but the real problem is they're too stupid and they've already taken over the world. Put this up with um, Brad Coleman's reflection that we're at this inflection point. Uh, we've seen some tremendous initial results from deep learning numerical weather prediction, but there is a significant risk that because of that initial success with some simpler variables like two meter temperature, that we think that they're ready to do everything. And we turn over to keys to a teenager that has not really been trained to drive the car. Well, in conventional numerical weather prediction, it's an extremely complicated system. And so, you know, I specialized in my time in NOAA, largely in ensemble prediction, but I did not develop during that time an expertise in land surface modeling, in microphysical parameterizations. So we have a deep bench within NOAA and within the broader um, academia and other government agencies, this expertise in various aspects of the system. And one of the things that I would argue, and this sort of goes back to what Eric DeWeaver was saying earlier on, was that we can leverage this um, as we work with this more black box system and develop and apply diagnostics um, that we develop for the conventional NWP system, often in cases that will make that jump to the deep learning systems. Next slide. And so here's just a couple examples, and I'm sure you can come up with many more yourself. In the upper left, we spend time and effort diagnosing in our global um, seasonal and subseasonal models the ability of these systems to predict MJO, to predict Kelvin waves, to predict internal um, gravity waves, things like that. And these diagnostics tell us something about the characteristics of the model relative to observations. In the upper right, there's been lots of predictability experimentation that shows us the characteristics of how errors grow in a, a numerical forecast consistent with our understanding of chaotic theory. Uh, Greg Hakem has done some work on tropical cyclone structure illustrated in the lower right. We would like these systems to have tropical cyclone structures with uh, a realistic, uh, you know, axisymmetric sort of circulation. And then in the lower right hand corner, this is an example from an old Judith Berner and colleagues paper on how, for example, in the CAM4 system, the forecast was much too regular with its El Nino. Point of just showing you these is that the sort of diagnostics that we have developed for conventional NWP, I believe can and should be used to help us make a more comprehensive evaluation as we move forward to deep learning numerical weather prediction. So how might this work? Next slide, please. I guess I have a hope that we might be able to build a repo that crosses government agencies, crosses private sector to public sector, to academic sector, and we each can contribute things that we might specialize in. So Google might be able to contribute an algorithm that provides a baseline forecast for deep learning numerical weather prediction. The government would provide reference standards for its global forecast system, let's say, as well as observation data. A cloud storage provider might provide the resources for us to host the voluminous data that we have with the understanding that then that brings uh, customers to use their cloud compute. Academic sector might contribute process diagnostics and so forth here. So with that, I'll end my prepared remarks. Thank you. All right, thank you, Tom. And uh, so just as a reminder, now we have, ooh, exactly 20 minutes um, to open it up for Q&A uh, across our three panelists. 
Uh, so just as Amy and I warned everybody, we would be asking everybody about trustworthiness. Um, and so I'll lead off that um, question and maybe we can hear from each of the panelists briefly if, if you have something to say about sort of what is your definition here of trustworthy or how does that factor in to the examples that you gave. You all gave some really nice examples of, of products, but how, how is trustworthy working in there? Um, and what does it mean to your to your group? So maybe whoever wants to start first. Um, Chris, I saw you nodding. Can I put you on the spot? Sure. Yep. Oh, I think my, my video went out again. Uh, hopefully it comes back. But um, yeah, just, um, oh, here it comes. <laughs> uh, so, I think, you know, when we th think about trust, I think for us, it's about, is it used, right? Are our forecasters uh, going to actually use this and, and incorporate into their forecast process? Um, you know, forecasters have a limited amount of time uh, to issue a forecast. There's only so much information they can look at for that forecast is, is actually due. So, um, and, and there tends to be actually a lot more information that can actually be uh, interpreted in that amount of time. So, so there are choices made and, and, and um, you know, being having it being used is, I think, a very critical aspect of, of trust. Um, and then, you know, more than that, I think when we talk about the guidance itself, I think um, there has to be an understanding of how is this tool arriving at its answer, right? Um, and I think the more that that can be revealed uh, to the decision maker, the better trust that can be established. Um, and so I think, you know, there's definitely, I've seen some tools out there that try to do that uh, more and more and, and reveal those kinds of things to the decision makers. And, and I think that, that those are very successful tools. So um, the more that, that that can happen, I think, uh, you know, obviously lends itself to trust. Thanks, Chris. And I think you bring up a really interesting point, um, especially about that there's only so much time right, to make some of these decisions. So while there are so many tools that may exist, the question still is which ones are are worthy of that, that amount of time you have. Uh, okay, Jason or Tom? Uh, I'll take a stab at that, not so much at a general um, definition of what trustworthy means, but maybe with a couple instances that I think are relevant here. You know, we have developed these systems, for example, that are optimizing to root mean square error. Can they then generalize to predict phenomena for which they were not optimized? I think that's a component of the trustworthiness. Uh, another thing that I think related is that we're going to be looking to see how well they represent rare events, uh, phenomena that are uh, very infrequent in time and in space. So can they represent a supercell? Can they represent a squall line? Can re they represent, based upon the large-scale environmental conditions, the, um, you know, the sort of uh, sensitivity that is often there um, in the small-scale detail to that large-scale that deep learning seems to show an ability to predict? Yeah, and certainly the same variation on the theme uh, for us here at EMC would be, in terms of trustworthiness, uh, would be skills, uh, the skill coming out of the model. And so like a verification system ensuring that uh, the model is performing robustly well. And that's one of the dangers that we're kind of seeing with some of the new data driven models, um, is that there's a lot of excitement as there should be. Uh, there's a lot of potential power for those, but a lot of the discussions that are going on behind the scenes, not only here at EMC, but at other national centers as well too, is uh, kind of what's been alluded to by the other two uh, panelists, is it doing the right thing for the right reasons? And, and is it able to capture extreme events as well too? Those are the exact discussions that we've had. I know uh, we looked at the Dubai event uh, not too long ago, and I don't think some of the data-driven models that we had looked at captured uh, that 100 year uh, flood and uh, rainfall event in Dubai, but the physical models did. And uh, that's where I think we need to use like verification tools that have been developed to be able to ensure that uh, some of these new and emerging AML tools are able to capture those events and that we can trust them so that uh, folks that like the Storm Prediction Center, um, which has been talked about here uh, from Chris, can also trust the models as well too. So what we're looking for is is robust and very, um, uh, very secure skills, uh, not just um, anecdotal. 
Um, it really does have to show, uh, these models really do have to show the same amount of skill as the physical models over long periods of time. And, and it has to show it for the right reasons as well, too. I think that actually, you, you almost answered the question I'm about to ask. There was a great question, uh, thank you to, to Russ Schumacher who put this one in the chat, which is, you know, for these, all these deep learning models, how much does it matter to you if the physical processes are correctly represented, if the key variables are still correct? Um, I think it I'll depends take whoever on, wants to answer. <laughs> yeah, I think it depends on the user. Um, uh, if uh, somebody down in the trenches, like a storm prediction center forecaster, is looking to the evolution, the physical evolution of, say, a severe storm event over time, then just seeing certain time steps at, at say, like a, a three or four or five or six hour uh, time step from a, from a forecast or something, uh, might not show the more intricate and intimate details. And I see Chris shaking his head, so he probably has a few thoughts on that as well too. Um, but uh, I think it depends on the user. Some, some folks may just wanna look at um, the, 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 the basic data coming out of a data-driven model and there's gonna be more power users that are gonna want more out of it. Yeah, and I'll just, I'll just mention briefly, um, I think that's one of the focus, uh, focus areas for the test bed, the Hazard Weather test bed this spring, we have the AI uh, in ML uh, in the BP emulators, and uh, we're, we're going to be looking at the soundings uh, coming out, kind of coming out of those. And you know, the soundings, of course, can reveal some of those physical attributes. Uh, you know, are they real? Or are they not? And so, I think we'll have some really exciting uh, results there. Uh, things, you know, I don't know if people have looked at this, you know, at this level of focus. Uh, of course, in the springtime here with severe convective weather, but uh, for for this type of of uh, AI uh, and NWP emulator uh, problem. So I think we'll have some some pretty cool results there. Tom, do you want to add anything? I, I think a number of you know that we have a, a collaboration now with NVIDIA at the Weather Company where we're going to be working toward developing um, a reforecast training data set that then can be used to train diffusion downscaling. And I think that diffusion downscaling, that generative AI is an example of where you are just not going to get the right answer for the right reason. What we're trying to do with that technology is assuming we can um, get the large scales correct from a global machine learning model, can we realistically downscale and get representative subgrid scale detail? We are making the, um, you know, we, we know that we just are not going to be able to give you a physically based answer, but can we give you a plausible statistically based answer based upon the training data that when we've seen supercells in the past and the environmental conditions in the past, do we end up putting in that subgrid scale detail that looks like a supercell thunderstorm? It's a research hypothesis. We sure hope so, but we don't go in with this expectation of getting the process right. Okay, so this um, question was from Carson Straub for Jason, but I actually think we can, it, it, it's applicable to all three of you. So the specific question is, are about the advantages and disadvantages of relying on observation gap filling, which can be done with ML, versus directly or directing efforts towards actually collecting more in situ observations from data sparse regions. And his question is specifically in order to improve model verification, but I do think there's room here to discuss sort of the importance of observations versus using some of these tools to try and navigate places. We, th th those observations either don't exist or, or are not re readily or easily available in the next, you know, Delta T. So any, any thoughts on that? Um, Jason, I might put you on the spot since it was originally intended for you and then go to Tom and Chris if they have additional thoughts. Sure. So one of the uh, things that we've been talking about within verification of, of using AML to do gap filling is right back to the trustworthiness question, uh, which is, let's say, depending on what AIML mathematical technique you use, you might get a gap-filled observation data set that improves the skill of your model or decreases the skill of your model. Um, which one is the, the one you're going to use? <laughs> which, which is the one that... Uh, will everybody will accept. Um, if there's 24 different mathematical techniques to do the gap filling, and uh, like I said, one shows a little bit of a little bit more of an improvement to your skill over another in a verification, 
uh, you have to be transparent about that. Uh, uh, you know, we can't just inflate scores uh, because uh, we like a better mathematical technique. So um, I think that there's some uh, some danger there, but there's also, uh, if it's transparent and the techniques are all agreed upon uh, uh, through the peer review process, then we might end up with uh, something that could be really helpful. In terms of getting more observations out there, of course, we all want more observations <laughs> uh, everywhere. And uh, I think that's just a matter, of course, of, of, uh, of, of funding and, uh, and, and trying to get that through uh, the budget processes. Uh, Anybody else want to tackle? Okay. A somewhat contrarian position here, which is uh, a hypothesis that I hope is true, which is that the importance of observations will be lessened in our uh, brave new world of deep learning numerical weather prediction. That So for example, uh, we observe surface fluxes from a, a relatively sparse surface flux network. And right now, basically those data have a local impact. Um, but an observation over North America is typically not used in any meaningful way to infer what the model should be doing over South America. In a deep learning training, I think there's a possibility that we can get a better representation in general where we have observations and then apply them elsewhere where we don't have observations. And in that way, um, maybe not have to have the same geographically widespread network of observations that you know we've typically put a lot of money in, in the National Science Foundation and in NASA and NOAA. I'm going to take us on a slightly different tack from the questions. Th thank you all for putting questions in Slido, by the way, and keep putting them in question questions in Slido. Libby and I are picking and choosing from the questions. I'm going to take us on a slightly different tack because I thought this was a really interesting one and a little different than what we've talked about. Um, and it comes from Neil Gordon. At the beginning, there was a mention of potential disruption across the value chain. What opportunities do the panelists see in terms of using AI and large language models for the last mile delivery of services to the end users? I know that Peter say, Neely was here. He would Neil's, be Neil's, the guy. <laughs> Neil's the guy on this. He presented on this topic at AMS. Um, so I think uh, if we have further questions, we should defer to his expertise, which is ahead of the rest of us. Nobody wants to answer for him, huh? Well, I'll, I'll take a small step. What do you mean? The, the, can you repeat the question? Maybe I misunderstood it. Asking what opportunities you see for the use of AI and particularly large language models to help enhance the last mile of delivery, right? So I, I could elaborate, but I might not be elaborating the way that Neil has in mind. I have thoughts on my own. But... So uh, this could be totally off base, maybe I'm not completely understanding, but uh, for example, like taking uh, taking a forecast, forecast and putting it into words, is that what's meant by like natural language model? That, that's what I would take out of that. And also okay. what I would take out of it is that you could do translation to different languages. Again, that's, that's part of my take too. on it, but. That's okay. what I thought would be good. Yeah, so the weather service is already doing that. We're using some AI ML techniques to translate um, some, some forecasts into Spanish. I don't know a whole lot about it, but I remember seeing some emails on that. So we're already doing that. Uh, and then of course, what's nice about AI ML, it allows like the context to be uh, put in more or emphasis on particular words, um, but I don't know too much about that effort because I'm not involved in that here, but I, I do know that that's being worked on here at NWS. Maybe I'll add a twist to the question before Libby asks her question that may, either any of you can think about is, how would you handle the trust issues that might get involved in that as well, right? If you're taking the, the large language model and you're using it to translate the impact, how do you handle the trust of that? Yeah, I'll just touch briefly. I think uh, the last slide I had, I showed kind of our impacts model, right? And it's, I think, maybe kind of geared toward that, where we're trying to develop something on top of our forecasts that try to meet a specific uh, class of end user. So for us, you know, FEMA, Red Cross. Um, and, and so for us, you know, I think it's about engaging them in the process of development um, and, and bringing them along with us in that. And uh, developing the kinds of tools that they really want to see um, and understanding what it is, what's their problems, what are what are they trying to to you know deal with in that immediate you know 24 hour post event triage phase where you know there's all there's that's where they operate. So if, you know specifically for that you know the impacts model uh, you know that's what we're trying to do there. So I think trying to develop 
very specific kinds of um, outputs that that meet their needs. A couple of thoughts in this regard. First of all, you know, we presumably are going to be feeding in fairly rich ensemble information to develop those words. You would want to make sure that your the words are matching the information content in that ensemble, that they're not hallucinating. I think we also want to have, you know, humans involved in the social scientists and have them work with the actual customers and say, are the words telling you something that's meaningful? If not, then you get back in sort of typical iterative feedback process of, of improving upon the product. Great. Okay. So we have another question. We'll go a slightly different direction now. Uh, we heard earlier, and given the discussion in the earlier session on this uh, data hoarding and IP issues, maybe, um, you know, thinking about these collaborations, how do you see those concerns playing out? And this specifically was geared towards Tom first, since Tom, I believe you listed, you know, the uh, multiple partners um, and a model for how you, you've been collaborating with those partners. So maybe thoughts on that, um, and then others, if you have thoughts, again, that would be great. Yeah, it's it's much on my mind. So within the weather company, I've tried to make this argument to our management chain that by us going out and sharing the data that we have as freely as we possibly can, we're going to be benefited so much more from the collaborations that we can build with other people than we would lose in a sense of giving a competitor an advanced peak at the data or the technology that we're developing. And I think, you know, um, I've gotten some traction, not complete traction with that argument, but I think, you know, Google has set an admirable standard and we ought to follow that of, of being very open. I'll just mention briefly, I guess, um, obviously, you know, everything we do SPC is uh, open and transparent and publicly available. So, you know, there's that, but obviously, you know, here at the National Weather Center in Norman, we have a lot of other local partners, OU, um, NSSL, uh, like I mentioned in my slides there. So um, obviously we try to try to leverage our, our local partners and, you know, obviously now being in the world we're in now, virtual is such a huge component. So um, so we're, we're not just thinking, you know, just in Norman, but really everywhere, you know, and, and just, um, Try, trying to build that expertise locally as well in the process as we form these collaborations and partnerships. Um, so that way, you know, like I said, R2O is our thing. So, um, you know, as we're transitioning these things, we have to be experts in them as well uh, in terms of uh, transitioning them, um, you know, maintaining them, and then obviously for our forecasters using them and then being able to explain that not only to uh, within our forecast, but also to the field, to the WFOs uh, that we are serving as well. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot, lot there involved, and and yeah, it's a obviously a great challenge. And I think I'm looking at the time, and it's my turn to ask a question. But what I'm understanding from looking at our schedule is that y'all get to come back in a few minutes. What we're going to do right now is we're going to transition to the next panel, and then we're going to do the same thing for like their, their talks, and then they get a short Q and A for them, and then everybody comes back and does a big Q and A. So we will see you very soon, and we're going to hold some of the remaining questions. And if we can get the other panelists to turn their cameras on, then I think the staff will show you up on the screen in a second, and I'll start the introductions. Um, I have to, I have to switch, I have like 20 tabs open to handle this. <laughs> I'm gonna wait until they show up before I do the introductions. Okay, great. So as our second part of doing um, trustworthy AI weather forecasts for end users, we have a second, fo uh, second panel focusing on trust in AI for weather forecasts. And um, I th this is gonna focus on end user acceptance of the products. And I think it's gonna follow the exact same format that we just did. Everybody's gonna give a chance to talk. Then we'll do Q and A for the speakers and then we'll do a group Q and A. So our first speaker is Reva Schwartz. Reva is a research scientist in the Information Technology Laboratory at NIST, where she serves as the principal investigator of bias in AI for NIST Trustworthy and Responsible AI Program. Thanks. Great. 
Uh, thanks so much. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Uh, some high level notes real quick about NIST and our work in AI. Uh, in case you are unaware, NIST is a federal agency under the Department of Commerce. Our mission is to promote US innovation and industrial competitiveness by advancing measurement science, standards, and technology in ways that enhance our quality of life. NIST's experience in building trust in new technologies in general and in AI research in particular is why the president entrusted us with a number of uh, responsibilities uh, to help fulfill the executive, the recently uh, launched, not that recently launched, I guess, executive order on safe, secure, and trustworthy AI. Uh, we also have a US AI Safety Institute and related consortium being established to support these activities and advance the science of AI safety. And once the tasks in the EO are complete, the AI Safety Institute will endure as a resource for the science of AI safety. Next slide. So I really wanna focus on our AI risk management framework, which NIST delivered in January, 2023, fulfilling a congressional mandate. Our team at NIST really focuses on trustworthy AI, trustworthy and responsible AI, um, and the risks and related impacts of AI and where, how, and for whom it's causing impact in the real world. AI systems are products of complex and interacting human, organizational, and technical factors. And there are many decisions made along the way before a given AI system is deployed or used. Making those decisions in a risk-informed way, using knowledge from across the organization and across the AI lifecycle, can improve the stability of the technology and build public trust in it. Equipping a risk-aware perspective within an organizational setting and across the life cycle takes a number of steps. Next slide. So enter the NIST AI Risk Management Framework, or AI RMF. While NIST had worked in the area of trustworthy and responsible AI prior to the AI RMF, our journey really kicked off in 2021 when Congress mandated NIST to produce a risk-based framework to, um, uh, for, for AI. Uh, the framework is voluntary. It's, it's a flexible resource. Uh, keyword there, voluntary. It is not regulation or required in any way, and there is nothing to comply with. It's a resource to assist organizations in the design, development, deployment, and use of trustworthy AI. We spent over 18 months working with more than 240 organizations in a multi-stakeholder, open, and transparent process to deliver the framework in January 2023, and this was after three, three public workshops, three uh, documents open for public comment and numerous listening sessions, all of which are on our website. Um, the framework assists organizations by building up a risk aware culture. So this is not about a checklist. Um, it's about helping uh, these organizations move from high level principles such as the notion of trustworthy AI or responsible AI moving to practice and to better anticipate, consider, and measure risks before they arise or treating them after they arise. Uh, so each part of an organization and relatedly the life cycle, uh, across the AI life cycle comes with its own actors, activities, teams, working at different parts and under varying contexts, which means we have uh, different risk perspectives. And they all have to work together to anticipate the harms and impacts uh, positive, not just negative, but also positive, and identify system limitations. So organizations can use the ARMF to build up this risk-aware culture and develop trustworthy AI. Next slide, please. So what is trustworthy AI? That's kind of a, a topic that um, we've been already talking about. Um, so it can mean different things to different people. And if you're a project manager or developer, you may not know how to actually put these various concepts or principles into practice when you're trying to make your system safe or transparent or fair or resilient. Um, so you can see these seven trustworthy characteristics that we defined in the NIST AI risk management framework uh, that, that define trustworthy AI uh, systems are safe, secure and resilient, explainable and interpretable, privacy enhanced, fair with harmful bias managed, not all bias is, har is harmful. Um, they're built in an accountable and transparent manner and at its foundation, as you can see right there underneath everything is validity and reliability. Because we can have AI that is fair or private or secure, but if it isn't valid and reliable, it cannot maintain those levels of fair or private performance over the long term. Uh, next slide, please. 
So how does trustworthy AI actually get developed and delivered? Um, this slide shows the AI risk management framework core where we uh, categorized uh, the risk management activities uh, into four functions. These are designed to move organizations from general risk management principles to specific practices for delivering trustworthy AI. So each of these functions is broken down into um, categories and subcategories. There are 72 actionable outcomes uh, that organizations can build towards on their path to creating a risk aware culture and delivering trustworthy AI. Uh, the govern function is where organizations set up policies, procedures, and institutional structures to align their operations with societal values or organizational values and existing legal and regulatory requirements. The math function is really about building up AI actor skill sets to anticipate risk, including how AI systems can be used in ways and, and repurposed and, and misused in ways that were not originally anticipated. The measure function is all about measurement, uh, repeatable, scalable, test evaluation, validation, verification processes. And the manage function is to uh, prevent risks that have already been mapped and measured or respond to them if they've actually materialized using policies that were established under the govern function. And then just real quick, the last slide. Um, we, uh, oh yeah, oh, <laughs> I thought I had forgot, I cut that slide out. Uh, so we have a playbook at um, AIRC.nist.gov uh, along with all sorts of other content and information. Uh, the playbook was developed to help AI risk management framework adopters know how to meet the outcomes in the framework course. So we have these 72 outcomes, but we want to help people understand how can they actually make their systems? What do they need to do? What are the examples? What should they be looking to do? So that's under uh, the Resource Center. We also have a glossary of trustworthy AI terminology there and a library of our technical documents, which um, uh, right now includes four of our draft deliverables for the uh, Presidential Executive Order on AI. So please feel free to uh, go there and provide public comment. The deadline is June 2nd, and I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm I, sorry, I need about five less tabs open so that I can make sure I am going to introduce the next panelist. So Ann Bostrom is our next panelist. Ann is part of AI2ES, um, and, and, but she does many, many other amazing things. Um, but I am officially reading the introduction. She is the Weisenhauser Endowed Professor in Environmental Policy in the Evans School of Public Policy and Governance at the University of Washington. Thank you, Amy. Um, I have the great pleasure of co-leading risk communication research in AI2ES, and, and the risk communication team views AI model guidance as a form of risk information for expert professionals users who can use it to manage risks from weather, climate, and coastal hazards. In uh, consistent with what Riva said, we also view trust and trustworthiness as social constructs of focal interest for developing and refining AI model guidance. We draw on theoretical and empirical social science literatures, and we apply social science methods in our fundamental research. The risk communication team shown here has the three goals shown here, including improving understanding of how key aspects of AI models, such as transparency, explanation, reproducibility, and reliability, for example, influence trust in AI, and second, developing models of how attitudes and perceptions of AI trustworthiness influence risk perception and use of AI, and the third goal shown here as well, which is um, more developing principled methods and to influence development of trustworthy AI and provision of AI-based information for improved decision-making. Next, please. We asked two questions in a research in a risk communication workshop that we held in 2022 very much aligned with the questions that were asked of this panel. First, how do people develop their trustworthiness assessments or perceptions? And second, how do AI developers design systems that are more worthy of trust? Several literatures were brought to bear in that discussion and have influenced our research, including the trust in automation and otherware literature, the literature on computers as social actors or CASA, the literature, I, discussed in the late, latest National Academies report on human AI teaming, and finally, risk communication research, including trust models such as the trust, confidence, and cooperation model by Earl Svetkovich, Segrist, and others. Underlying those literatures are a long history of research on interpersonal and organizational trust, including research on judgment and decision-making processes that are more fundamental. 
As our colleague Chris Wurz often highlights, trust is inherently emotional and, subje emotional and subjective. This complicates efforts to calibrate trustworthiness and develop standards. To develop trustworthy AI, the risk communication workshop participants decided that we need to improve measurement of trust in AI as a dynamic contingent process to learn which contingencies and contextual factors actually matter through co-design and co-production and engagement across the entire AI life cycle shown, shown here. And finally, we need to develop and test strategies for communicating the uncertainties of AI model outputs. And these topics are covered in more depth in the site citation shown here. And I'll be talking in the next few slides about uh, our work in the, in the center, focusing specifically on an example from a paper led by Mariana Keynes. Next. So to the best of our current understanding, trustworthiness stems from intersecting factors, including users' decision-making needs and context, data quality and representativeness, model development processes, techniques and specifics, model availability, interpretability, explainability, and integration into users' workflows, and perceptions of the model developer's expertise, as well as model skill across hazards and geography. And this echoes many things we've heard from the other speakers previously today. As shown in this diagram here, uh, is uh, our research is convergence. We use an approach that includes atmospheric scientists and AI scientists and developers and professionals such as National Weather Service forecasters to study trust and trust trustworthiness of AI model guidance being developed for those professionals whose decisions affect society at large. So we specifically chosen decision makers who have impactful decisions. Our methods draw from across the social and behavioral sciences, for example, our semi-structured interviews include pre and post surveys, attitude questions derived from diverse bodies of research I mentioned earlier, and a think aloud decision task that's modeled on the mouse lab experiments in early judgment decision-making research several decades ago. We've been focusing on a variety of use cases illustrated at the top here, and I will talk about the, the severe convective use case in the next slide. Next. So uh, these uh, these... Oops, that was too forward. Can we move back one, please? Thank you, thank you. So the Keynes et al. study focuses on, focuses on National Weather Service forecasters' assessments of two prototype AI models, a random forest-based technique to predict the probability of one and two inch hail, and a two-dimensional convolutional neural net trained to predict the probability of convective storm mod mode being supercellular, quasi-linear, or disorganized. To understand what factors or features affect the trustworthiness of AI guidance, forecasters were asked to think aloud as they worked through a slide deck with curated information about six select factors of the guidance. The slide deck for the random forest hail probability guidance is shown on the left, probably too small for you to see. Um, and the slide deck for each product provided information on the AI technique, the training of the algorithms, input variables, or the graphical user interface interactivity, verification, who the developers were of the model, and comparisons to other sources of information. For each factor, as shown on the right, forecasters categorize the information as either decreasing, having no impact, or increasing the trustworthiness of the AI ML product, and thought aloud as they completed this decision task. Next. Minutes. Thank you. And this is my last slide. On the left, you see here um, an example of the survey responses from forecasters before and after exploring those six slides. On the right are excerpts from the qualitative verbal protocol analyses that are at the heart of the Keynes et al. paper, which is forthcoming in weather and forecasting. The findings illustrate trust processes at several levels. And maybe I should explain first that on the left, you can see people's judgments before the sh seeing these, detail this, these detailed information slides um, in with the dots and on the right are triangles showing their judgments afterwards. So there may be some demand effect, but by and large, these judgments were seen as increasing their judgments of, these, these information slides were seen as increasing their um, judgments of trustworthiness of the guidance. The, the findings do illustrate trust processes at several levels. At the prototype specific scale, hand labeling of inputs for the AI storm mode guidance increased stated trustworthiness, as illustrated in the highlighted quote here on the right, though people still wanted more information. This, in, this increase in stated trustworthiness was, however, contingent on labelers having the relevant domain expertise to label those inputs. 
an important contingency. For both prototypes, information about the AI model input variables and about model, model, model performance, especially failure modes, and being able to interact with the AI model output increased forecasters' AI guidance trustworthiness ratings. In sum, contingent integration, excuse me, continued integration of social sciences into convergence research on AI with met methodological diversity and rigor, we think will help advance AI and its applications in weather. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now we are going to move to Will, William Livingston. Um, William Livingston is a postdoctoral research associate at the Institute for Public Policy and Research and Analysis at the University of Oklahoma. Hi, thank you, Amy. So uh, for this presentation, I'll be talking about perceptions in AI broadly, and then how it is distinct from other technology perceptions people have. And then I will go into how these perceptions manifest in weather forecasting in particular, as well as in other policy domains. So these slides are generated from a nationally representative survey of American adults that I conducted in the summer of 2023. One of the first questions I was interested in this research was identifying is AI distinct from algorithms or other advanced technology systems? So to answer this question, and we're already on the right slide, I conducted an effective imagery experiment where survey takers were split into three groups and asked to generate three different words or phrases when they considered the terms artificial intelligence, algorithms, and advanced technology. And here on the slide, you can see the top 15 most common phrases or words that came to people's minds. One of the interesting things I wanna point out right off the bat is that in both apps, you see artificial intelligence popping up. So clearly AI is on people's minds, even when they're not prompted with a discussion about that topic. Also important thing I wanna point out is you'll see right at near the top for AI, number two is scary. Scary appears again in advanced technology, pretty low towards the bottom, and about the 2% of people saying that. But overall, uh, it doesn't, things in those, those negative kind of connotations didn't necessarily appear in the other one. So it's interesting to see. see. And if we can go to the next slide, we'll go into a little more detail about that. So I also tasked my survey participants to generate a score for each of the word phrases that they generated based on how negative or positive it was for on a scale of one to five. And this slide shows the breakdown of these evaluations as well as the means. So one of the first things I wanna point out is that all three of the groups, AI, algorithms, and advanced technology, and a mean score above three, meaning that all were considered to be more positive than negative by people surveyed. However, that being said, AI just barely made it over that threshold at a mean of 3.16, whereas both algorithms and advanced technology had a, a, a statistically significantly higher and more positive uh, evaluation. So this is driven in large part, as you can see in the graph, by relatively flat levels of support of the uh, uh, emotional valence towards AI uh, with it hovering around 20%, whereas algorithms had a central tendency towards uh, neither positive nor negative with a slightly po uh, uh, positive uh, tail and advanced technology had a much more positive uh, focus. Now, if we can go to the next slide. Perfect, thank you very much. Here I get more directly into how people view AI in particular policy areas. And in this case, it's gonna be weather forecasting. So across these graphs, I have weather forecasting shown in orange. It might be red, red on your screen. It's been fluctuating in how it's uh, being displayed, but hopefully it's clear. And minor weather forecasting shown in purple. For the purposes of my survey, I defined uh, extreme weather forecasting as prediction of tornado events and minor weather forecasting as prediction of chance of precipitation. And here you can see in the top left graph, this shows that survey respondents evaluated the level of perceived risk in the use of artificial intelligence and weather forecasting on a scale of one to seven, where one means it's not risky at all, and seven means it's extremely risky. Interestingly, in this graph, you can see that the mean for perceived risk uh, for extreme weather forecasting was 3.9, meaning that it was below the midpoint and that people on average had a view of using AI for this extreme weather forecasting as less risky than as opposed to more risky, but this did not hold for minor weather forecasting where people on average viewed it as slightly more risky than less risky. The top uh, right graph shows perceived subjectivity on a scale of one to seven, where one means the domain is completely objective and seven means the domain is completely subjective. And here, both of these measures uh, were viewed as being more subjective than they were objective. 
And finally, on the bottom left corner, the, um, this uh, show, graph shows the overall level of support people have towards the adoption of AI. And in this case, both minor and extreme weather forecasting had a meet scores above the midpoint, meaning that overall people were supportive of the use of AI, both for minor and extreme weather forecasting. Now, if we can go to the next slide. That should have colors and dots. And so, unfortunately, we might have some difficulty being clear about it. But hopefully you can see weather forecasting M in the lower left quadrant is about at a negative one, negative one. And for that, for those previous purposes, that means the standardized risk associated for minor weather forecasting is about one standard deviation lower than the average standardized risk for these other domains in the policy space. And you can hopefully see, oh, you can hopefully see weather forecasting E, that's for extreme weather forecasting, right about in the, uh, right about in the middle of the graph. And that should be as a line pointing to where that is located. Thank you so much, whoever has the cursor. And so hopefully you can see where that line coming off it is pointing to, that's where it, it would, the dot indicating it would be located. And the big takeaway to take from this graph is kind of where these um, where these different policy domains are located. And you can't see because the colors and sizes of the points are all missing, but weather forecasting, uh, minor and extreme both have much higher levels of support as well. So their standardized level of support is about at a 1.2 to 1.8. Uh, they're in that they're in that bracket. And so um, so those are very supported, considered less risky, and considered less um, subjective than these a lot of these other policy domains, such as air traffic control, you can see on the far right, or a drug analysis in this case, or the FDA seen in the, uh, in the top leftmost corner. So that's to give you a sense that uh, for weather forecasting, both for minor and extreme, as uh, conducted by the survey, overall, we I, I, I was able to find that they, for all policy areas, as risk levels decrease and as subjectivity decrease, perceived perceptions about them, the overall level of support increased dramatically. And so as of right now, uh, both, of, both of the weather forecasting areas I examined are ripe for taking advantage of these perceptions and having higher levels of support, especially relative to a lot of the other areas where AI is already being used. And I think with that, I can end. Oh, and there's my contact information as well, the QR code, if you're interested in some of my research. Or this is all published in my dissertation, and it's soon to be hopefully placed into articles and journals. Thank you. Um, OK, and we're going to move to our last panelist. And then remember, we're going to do this the same as we did the last one. We'll have our Q&A after Scott gets to talk. We'll have our Q&A for everybody. So. Um, our next panelist is Scott Macaro. He's the head of insights and innovation at Vaisla uh, X Weather, and I think he's all alone in being the panelist who's in the room. So he is taking the entire table up there. Take it, Scott. Is this microphone working? Okay. The, the only person in person has a technical problem here. That's great. Um, thank you so much for having me. I, I appreciate being here today. Um, if you want to go ahead to the next slide. Um, you know, this slide will mimic some of the things we've heard today, but when we think about approaches in AI, AI is this really blanket term that covers a whole variety of technologies. Um, we're employing technologies from simple rule-based models all the way through the transformer-based generative AI models. And our choice of technology really varies depending on what weather parameter we're interested in, what problem we're trying to solve, the temporal or spatial problems we're trying to solve. Is the data continuous? Is it intermittent? There's a lot of, lot of factors that go into which AI we use. Um, but the point of this slide is to really point out that the approach to trustworthiness and quality also varies depending on our choice of technology. So it becomes quite the multi-dimensional problem. Um, and so you may even ask yourself, you know, is it really worth it? So I wanted to go to the next slide here. Um, so we wanted to talk about why do we AI at all? Uh, so I sat down for a moment and I thought, what is, it, what is the actual benefit that our end users are getting? And, and is it really worth putting all this energy in? Um, the spoiler is yes, it definitely is, but I'll give you some quick examples here. Um, in the uh, top left corner there, you see maximizing the impact of data as a company who has the ability to produce sensors and create the data that unlocks the power of a lot of this AI. 
Um, one of the promises of AI is its ability to maximize the use of that data. Uh, we're able to infer things from the data that we may not even be physically representing in some of our model predictions. Um, speed is something that's very familiar for a lot of people. These models can run incredibly fast once they're trained, gives us the opportunity to produce very large ensembles. Um, you see better predictions. We are absolutely seeing better predictions, um, especially at the local scales. And I think that's a, that's a key point there is as we narrow the focus of our AI, we do see tremendous improvements. Um, a lot of our end users are looking for very specific decisions in very specific industries and for use cases, and we're able to produce better predictions for them. Um, I already mentioned the local impacts, so I'll just briefly talk about here in the middle. Um, we actually spend a lot of our time focused on weather, but most of our end users you know, aren't all that concerned about weather all the time. They, they feel the impacts of weather, but they're trying to make decisions about their businesses. And so a lot of times we're producing decisions for their business that happen to be impacted by weather. Um, the other thing is you see this term modern technology here, which is a point that I wanna make that whenever we look at modern technologies, which as we just learned, artificial intelligence definitely is, we're usually only looking at modern technologies if we can be more effective or more efficient in what we do. And AI is doing exactly that for us in a whole variety of applications. And then the last slide here, I want to be a little bit more tactical on trust and acceptance here. Um, for those of you familiar with Vicela, quality is not an option for us. We've built our reputation on this for almost 90 years. Um, and so just because we don't develop the technology, but we want to apply it, that doesn't give us a pass to not pay attention to quality and trustworthiness. So ways that we're building trust, um, as I sat down and thought about it, and I'm speaking on behalf of teams of scientists here, but it turns out that a lot of the ways that we're building trust are the same ways that we've been doing in science for decades. Some of that might be just verification and validation. You've heard those words multiple times today. These are very important in some ways, almost magnified. Um, as somebody who's been in numerical weather prediction a few decades, there was a time that if you put poor data into a model, it would blow up. That's not so much the case with AI. So you have to be double sure that that data is high quality and trustworthy. Um, this appropriate technology that we talked about, that kind of goes back to the first slide. The technologies that you need for temperature may not be the same that you need for precipitation. And so you wanna make sure that you're approaching the right technology and thinking about how to make that trustworthy. And we actually force the AI to earn our trust. Um, in some ways that's really narrowing the scope of the technology. Um, sometimes you'll train a model and it will not perform as well as the previous model. And so again, this isn't rocket science, right? These are, these are conversations we've been having for decades, but we have to really pay attention to them here with AI. And then when we think about accepting AI-based products from our users, one thing I wanna point out is that many of our users expect AI these days, right? Many of our end users associate AI with, with good quality, whether that's right or wrong, that is the case. Um, and so we're already a little bit ahead of the curve in terms of our customers are expecting it to begin with. Now that does, again, put the onus on us to make sure that the technologies we're putting out are trustworthy. Um, some of this is by using confidence levels via the probabilistic models. So we do a lot of probabilistic modeling with these AI technologies. It allows us to give a confidence interval. That becomes very important for some applications um, because the technology on our end user side may not be something that we have any insight at all. And so their decisions on whether or not to trust the decision uh, could be completely based on something that we have no insight on. Um, the benchmarks become very important for us. This kind of goes back to the validation, the verification, um, but we have to set some sort of benchmark to understand whether the AI is the appropriate technology to begin with. And then every subsequent training since then needs to also stand up against that benchmark. And we constantly re revisit our benchmarks. And then you see this bit about continuous education. That's both internally and externally. It takes a lot of work to educate our customers on the benefits of AI, why they should trust it. We ourselves have to continuously keep up on this. The speed of this is just unbelievable to me. I mean, we are, we are rapidly watching AI change the way that we understand, predict, and interpret the weather. Um, and with that, I'll stop and look forward to the conversation. Thank you. If we can get all the panelists to turn their cameras back on and join Scott virtually at the table. <laughs> he has plenty of room. He's letting you know. And I'm while we're getting panelists highlighted, um, because I have heard that Reva has to 
to leave uh, before the end of the q and A. I'm going to ask Riva a question first, but of course she's the one who's not actually highlighted yet. So hopefully she's going to show up. There she is. Okay. So Riva, this question is for you. Um, thank you. Thank you for the language of risk aware culture. This came from one of the questions. Yeah. I actually don't know who put it up there, but I'm reading them. Thank you for the language of the risk aware culture. What do you and all of the panelists perceive as literacies to be developed or cultivated to have a society more aware of the risks? For example, statistical literacy, team science, et cetera. Yeah, so um, all of that relates to an interdisciplinary team, uh, something we talk really strongly about um, in the AI risk management framework that I know uh, across every domain in science, everybody wants to do, but is really, really hard to actually make a re make real. Um, so uh, we support a lot of uh, ongoing study here with a NIST of thinking about how we can actually um, make interdisciplinarity easier within uh, uh, within what are current Currently homogenized uh, domains. Uh, so that's that's first off uh, transparency and uh, making sure that our our tools and our the outputs of our systems, the outputs of what it is we're doing when we test and evaluate our systems, are understandable across the different domains is really important. Um, and the kind of uh, one of the reasons why we did our trustworthy AI uh, glossary at NIST was that we knew um, a lot of these words in. Uh, and concepts within trustworthy AI mean different things to different people, um, not surprisingly. And uh, so getting people to understand that there may not be one, you know, that there is not one definition for certain uh, concepts. Uh, bias is actually a really good example of that. Um, and, uh, and, and, and kind of changing, improving our awareness uh, across these kind of uh, scientific silos. Anybody else wanna tackle that question? I would just double down on what Reva said. It's um, interdisciplinary is really important. Um, I do think it's important to think uh, very clearly about literacies for professional groups and and in specific disciplines. Interdisciplinary comes uh, more di is more difficult for some people to come by than others, and people get really focused on, for example, climate science might not have as uh, as broad an appreciation of interdisciplinarity as they need to really enter into the AI space in a in what we would consider a reasonable way for the full for trustworthy AI to be developed. Okay, um, so I'm gonna combine, a, I think a great question that was meant for Will here, but I, I, I get to use the opportunity as a moderator to inject my own broader question. So I'll start with the broad one and then Will, I'll focus in for you first. So just be ready. So is there a misalignment or difference between public perception of AI for weather versus the scientists and teams that many of you represent here? Is this a problem? Do they need to be aligned? And then going to the specific question, maybe Will, you could first tackle, was a question about, could you comment how much of the fear around AI, I think that, um, that's the scary word, is driven by media narratives as opposed to people's familiar familiarity and use of tools such as ChatGPT? Uh, these may be separate questions, but I think overall this, this difference between public versus sort of the technical scientist perception. So we'll take it away, and then I'm hoping um, we can hear from, from the others. Absolutely. So just to give a little context to the timeline of when my survey was conducted, it happened right over the summer of March, or this, excuse me, the summer of last year. And so it, to give you, keep in mind, I think ChatGPT4 had just very recently become not publicly available, but paid for available. And so there was a lot of early discussion kind of like on, oh my goodness, and now it's developing images and the images have too many fingers. And so uh, just to keep it, keep in sense of like where we are now with how AI is being used for the public versus where we were then, uh, that's where that's where I'm comfortable in. But I will say that I there was a large uh, series of people talking about like specific cases. So in my in my day in my survey, I also asked, and this was of the public. This wasn't necessarily of experts, but I, I gave an area for them to give comments. And a lot of people mentioned the lawsuits going on that were going on at the time against ChatGPT about uh, copyright issues, and there was also the concerns about art and copyright. I don't think that those arguments were quite as developed yet. But a lot of these considerations were impacting how people were re relating, in large part, towards these 
more broader, more consumer-based AI um, systems. My survey did focus more on the technical aspects of uh, usage of AI. So the things like machine, machine learning for like different data sciences, those weren't necessarily considered. It was more about when the word AI is being used, what narratives are people generating in their heads and then how those narratives kind of can be shaped and are different by different groups. So I can also go into that a little more if there's questions along those ends. As to experts, I can't speak too authoritatively, unfortunately, on the expert perceptions. Uh, I will say this, every co-worker in my office hates the topic of AI because it has a tendency to suck in every, conver every conversation and it becomes the key factor. In fact, we have like a little square draw jar for lunch. If anyone brings up AI too much, you have to put in the dollar. Uh, so <laughs> it's, <laughs> AI is an interestingly uh, attention grabbing topic, I will say. Maybe Anne should tackle the question about the experts. I, uh, um, boy. Uh, so let's see. I'm, I'm sorry. The lights are doing something funny in the room here. Um, the the um, well, AI for experts. I, there are there are some of the residual concerns that we uh, that um are associated with things that Will has mentioned do come up in some of the expert interviews. So people are concerned, for example, about AI and their jobs. Uh, in particular, and there's a very strong sentiment among forecasters that humans need to stay in the loop. And I think that echoes what we've heard from other people here today. AI isn't sort of ready to be let off the leash, so to speak. And um, more broadly, the, the whole question is reminiscent of the broader literatures and the risk communication and risk perception research from several decades on issues of stigma, for example, that can be associated with specific problems with a, a technology. Um, and so we can hear that with regard to, for example, loss of, of privacy um, around the way da data gets sucked into AI. Uh, and there are also issues around uh, differences between expert and lay uh, perceptions, which I think we're going to see echoed here in this domain as well, where experts have, a well, we haven't seen many studies on this yet, but I, I, I anticipate that we'll see similar kinds of differences where experts, depending on the domain of application and their level of expertise, may view the risks differently than non-experts do. Hey, Amy, I'm just going to make- Scott? Yes, yeah, Scott, go for as, it. As I've been listening to this, I've been kind of reflecting, thinking about um, my own world where if I think about the developers and those involved in the machine learning um, coding and the ML ops space, um, and, and especially when we recruit these individuals, there's an expectation that they're going to work on AI. Um, and it's interesting because when I think about the scientists and the experts, it's almost like we're the ones saying, wait, wait, wait. Um, and, and so that's sort of an interesting perspective that we may have a role as a community <laughs> to actually be holding up the flag saying, you know, pay attention here. Um, so I, I, you know, I experience a very, very fast um, moving development team um, and scientists, at least in our team, who are saying, okay, let's, let's take a look at this for a moment, right? Um, I think I articulated my thought there. Okay, I'm going to ask the next question and, and I'm going to ask this one specifically of Reva first because I know she's leaving shortly. But I think this question is for everybody because I think it's a really interesting one. It came from the Q&A from Bill Campbell, but I'm going to adapt it. And that is, can you come up with an example of where bias is actually good? Because all we talk about right now is how bias is bad. Thanks for that question. Yes, and it's actually quite easy. So uh, cognitive bias is what gets us through the world every day. Um, we wouldn't be able to make sense of any information if it didn't work. So uh, so sorting through the fire hose of information on any given day is, is, is the purpose of bias. Um, so uh, if you think about your Netflix queue or your Amazon card or whatever, like, uh, what, what these systems have done is learn who you are and what you might want to see. Um, and it helps you, it, it is helpful in that manner. Uh, of course, it can go too far. Um, and it can maybe give you things that you're just tired of seeing. <laughs> or maybe, you know, it reduces the novelty of what you see. Uh, there's a lot of uh, different ways that it becomes harmful. But um, the default actually for bias is, is actually to help us as, as humans uh, navigate our way through, through our lives. See lots of head nodding. Anybody want to add? Yeah, I think um, it's interesting. It's almost the opposite of the scary side. I think because AI is this great new technology, there's a lot of curiosity. Um, there's there's tremendous willing to play, um, which is different than willingness to pay. Um, but there's a tremendous you know willingness to play with these technologies and test them. And there's a lot of learning that we can do with our customers and community 
And, and I think that bias towards new technology is giving us a nice opportunity here. I actually really thought uh, the comment you made that uh, that the public expects AI because they expect that to be the shiny, coolest thing was a really interesting comment. Yeah, it, there, it remains to be seen, Amy, as you know, uh, the extent to which cognitive biases that we are familiar with that help us get through the day have manifest themselves in how the technologies have been developed. And so we, we, we have to look more carefully at how biases are entering into the development of AI and how they're manifesting in the out, outputs from AI. And I think that will give us a lot more information about how to, to um, maybe treat AI in a way that will, will increase its trustworthiness. So it interacts with lots of other kinds of potential biases. And I was just going to say it interacts with many of those seven trustworthy characteristics is that, you know, um, if if we can't see if, the, if our systems aren't explainable, we don't know what is being kind of squashed and flattened and uh, about our, our human behavior into those data sets and in through the machine learning pipeline. Um, and so, uh, so a lot of our biases are, are, are systemic, societal, cognitive, human, uh, individual biases get, get um, pushed forth and we don't know, we can't, we can't trace that. So, um, so this is where all of these trustworthy characteristics interact. Absolutely. And I just wanted to add, and this is speaking more generally about AI, not in the weather domain particularly, but I do know that in areas of uh, medical diagnosis, they're using AI for uh, helping to identify an imagery of potential areas of cancer. And so you can imagine a bias system where the bias is just towards more false positives to bring attention towards the human in the loop so that they are more carefully examining mm -hmm. the key indicators. And so you can imagine how that can translate into the weather system. You could have the system keyed up towards false positives so that it draws attention to the key areas in the system where a human could then take advantage of that, that built-in bias. Okay, so we we heard actually in the last panel, multiple panelists brought up the idea of sort of getting the right answer for the right reasons. And you're, you know, you folks have, are coming up from slightly different perspective and in how you approach the, these questions. And so this is a question from Slido. It's um, regarding um, uh, and slide, but I think again, for everyone, have you found in your work that AI machine learning needs to be physics-based to be trustworthy? And so you could interpret that potentially as that it's learning physics um, mechanisms and processes, but you could also learn that as, in, you know, do we need to be including the physics in the um, AI architecture or, or setup for people to trust it? Um, and it may be that they aren't even aware that that's a possibility in the first place, right? Which I think is an important point too. So um, I don't know if maybe Anne, would you be willing to start? Sure. Um, boy, you guys should address this too, Libby and Amy. <laughs> but um, there, there is, uh, to the extent that verification relies on uh, the outputs uh, 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 being in accord with physics principles, I think there is there is a, a need for um, that to be aligned. So it is a question of sort of whether you think of it as being in the mechanisms or being in the outputs. And um, among the forecasters, at least, there's a t tendency to veer in that direction, that they want the outputs to align with their understanding of the physics of the system is, is my takeaway from what we've seen. So you could say that about any kind of fundamental principles for these weather and climate models that that um, there there's the experts and professionals who are working with the models want to be able to interrogate the model and see that it behaves the ways they expect and to the extent that that requires it being physics based then yes um, that doesn't probably directly address the question they were asking but it does seem to me that the field is moving in some creative ways towards achieving that I'm just going to take the moment to to say goodbye to you all. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you, you. Yeah. and as you continue, and uh, I will see you all soon. Bye bye. <laughs> thank bye. you. Thank you. Yeah, Scott. I don't know if you have any thoughts on this. I, I'm just trying to figure out how to say it without spending half an hour on the topic. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think there's there's two ways for me to think about this. If you if you sufficiently narrow the scope of of the problem. Um, I have absolutely seen cases where AI has worked marvelously without physics, um, where the data itself is, is capturing the effects of, I mean, it could be as simple as a building or trees that the models simply don't explicitly resolve. 
Um, but if I think about, you know, the larger, I mean, the good thing about some of our physics is these are laws, right? The laws of physics are there and then the, the machines better mimic that, right? But if you think about the parameterizations and the other approximations that we're making, there's a lot of opportunity, I think, right there for AI had immediate impact. Um, and then once we kind of get all that right, I mean, there's, there's just a future where I guess we're going to find out, aren't we? <laughs> so, yeah. And I guess what I would say to that as best I can do is uh, TBD, unfortunately. I know my institute is working on developing a national uh, survey that we're going to start doing annually, evaluating the public's perception about AI and across a series of different domains and hopefully incorporating some experiments as we continue to take it to do it through the years. And I know that this is one of the areas, the level of complexity complexity involved in the AI system and how people's uh, about uh, perceptions change because of that is one of the very first areas we're gonna wanna do. So soon, hopefully we'll have some data on that that we can be, be happy to share. That will be fascinating, Will. That's really exciting. Thank you. And I think um, we have one more question for this panel and then I think we're gonna do the combined panel set of questions next. So I'm gonna ask this one. Um, this came from Bruce Crawford in the Slido. And earlier it was suggested that if you put bad data into the AI ML model, it might not blow up. So what's the current capability of an AI ML system to recognize various types of error conditions or are there any horror stories for weather and climate? Is that a question for us or for the combined panel? <laughs> Maybe that's a combined panel question. Maybe that's a good time to bring everybody in. We could do that. If everybody, if Tom's already got his camera on. If the others want to turn their camera on, they can get pinned into the screen. All right, now who wants to take that question? Do you want me to read it again? I, I'm thinking of, okay, you know, AIFS at the European Center. It is a system which isn't trained to detect bad data. Now, an extension of AIFS that said, how unlikely are the initial conditions relative to everything that I've been trained on in the past? You know, you could build that sort of functionality in that would allow you to say, this doesn't look realistic here, mm. uh, but you'd have to build that component of the system. Yeah, I'll just, I wanna say, I, I agree with that. Um, you know, real-time data is very messy, right? It's really hard to QC uh, data that comes in uh, and sometimes it's, you know, it's impossible to catch everything. So uh, I think AI ML is, has to have a capacity to, identify and filter these types of things. And so feeding it uh, data that is messy um, and being able to process that as a necessary component. Um, so, yeah. I can give one oh. short horror story if you want that is just funny. When we were writing up a tutorial paper that, that has since been published, the original version of it, we played with putting the data far, very far out of range. And if you put the data far enough out of the range, you can get some really, really crazy uh, predictions. So for example, we were able to predict that the temperature was gonna be hotter than the surface of the sun simply by giving it something that was out of range, right? But on the other hand, it's not like anybody would have used that model. We were really trying to show breaking it. So I, I'm not hearing anybody saying any horror stories, which I think is I, good. Oh, I thought Amy, I thought... <laughs> <laughs> Go in. <laughs> I was going to say there there could well be horror stories. I say if you think about underrepresented, I mean just the representatives of the data sets, there are probably biases built into the data sets that are being incorporated now, and we just they're subtle and we don't recognize them, and they may be inhibiting better performance. So, but uh, Tom's suggestion that you build in functionality that can can look at the quality of the data seems like the right way to go. I think Scott's trying to say something too. Yeah, I mean, maybe not a horror story, just a small example. Um, I know we're thinking a lot about weather, but if we think about just adjacent examples such as wind energy generation, you know, if 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 you're not familiar with some of these auxiliary data sets, you may get generation data that isn't telling you if a turbine was taken down for maintenance, right? So so this kind of information gets inherently messy very quickly. Um, so maybe it's better to keep our conversation specifically to weather right now, but very quickly you can get into some horror stories. I think it's a good question in that there's now effort from Aardvark Weather, effort at the European Center to start developing these systems that directly map from data through to a forecast, bypassing 
the data simulation, which conventionally has had a, a very rigorous quality control process where you're checking the satellite radiance against uh, GPS radio occultation for its quality. And as we build up these alternative systems, we probably are going to need to be building in some sort of notion of quality control that parallels what we've done with conventional data simulation. Yeah, and, and just to jump off of that, the quality control side, Amy, I agree, no one would use that that particular temperature prediction, but if that was merely one piece of some pipeline, right, this implies that certain quality control has to be potentially built in in a way that it wasn't in physics-based models or in, in our previous type sorts of models because maybe they just never would predict that number. So it doesn't, it's just not merely a plug and play. And I think Tom's point again about QC is, is critical. All right, so um, this was a question actually that was asked on Slido quite a bit ago, but I think it's right for this whole group, which is why I saved it. So there was a mention of tools that allow one to unravel or diagnose AI algorithms. And they're asking, can you speak more to that? And how important is this for users? So I think the person they're talking about explainability techniques, something near and dear to my heart. And I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit either about um, what those tools are, if you're familiar with them, or how important it is to your users rather than just the end skill. Or we've heard already just if the end result and output jives with what you know they were sort of expecting before. Um, is there a need for these additional explainability methods to take it even further. Um, is there anyone who would like to start? Sure, I'll and jump that'd in. Be great. I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah. So in a in some work that we haven't published yet, um, we I involved Waylon um, Collins, a National Weather Service forecaster, and uh, in that, and so he probably made comments on this at the workshop last week. But we um, we did look at an XAI tool, and um, that specifically showed. Um, the inputs and how and included a rough categorization of the inputs into different categories of types of variables as a way of explaining what was going on with the model. And that, um, I don't know, from an outsider's perspective, someone who's not trained in meteorology, that was very reassuring to see how the model, what the model was doing. I, it didn't, it didn't seem to rise to the top in terms of the things that influenced what the forecasters were thinking, but Waylon liked it. Um, so I, I think that there are a, a variety of tools, XAI tools, of course, that, that you all use and know about that are available, and some of them are more or less uh, useful, and there needs to be a lot more work on what kinds of XAI tools are helpful for people. Yeah, I'll just I'll just briefly note too. Yeah, it's just similar similar kind of note uh, things to note there. Just that um, you know, oftentimes for us, you, you know, you'll see like say a probability, right? Probability of something, um, and probability itself is non-dimensionalized. It's um, just a number. But how is it that it's getting at that uh, answer? How's it getting at arriving at that number? And so to dig a little deeper, right? Maybe at that particular grid cell, or, or um, you know, what? How is it arriving at that? So uh, a lot of times, obviously, we you know use principal component analysis or things like that to limit the number of predictors in the model, and uh, from that we can then dig in and see, okay, what is the relative contribution uh, to this answer from those uh, top set of predictors? Um, and in doing so, I think then that that for the decision maker, they can just read that, decide that, or decipher it and see if that's something that, you know, seems like it jives pretty well with, with their conceptual model uh, or or not. And, you know, and sometimes that can be can be a good thing. Sometimes it can be a good challenging thing that can, uh, you know, lead to more questions. Um, but, you know, I think it, there's obviously a big process there uh, to consider. So, uh, yeah, to me, it just, again, trying to help reveal uh, some of those aspects to the decision maker um, if the time allows, right? Uh, but uh, can really can really help. I've done some pretty brain dead things, feeding in, you know, an input that's X and then X plus Delta X to get a sense of the output sensitivity. Um, they've largely often left me confused on a higher level rather than being tremendously illuminating. Those aren't brain dead, by the way. Those are specific XAI techniques, I would say. 
I mean, that, there are plots that are known for doing that. You know, you, you change the, the input all the way through the range and you see what happens. I, I just would argue against it being brain dead. Okay. It, it struck me as very simple. Mm -hmm. But okay. actually, Tom, this is, a, this is an interesting point that actually has really permeated this whole day so far. We've heard a lot of panelists talk about we're, a lot of what we're doing is no different than what we were doing before. And I think that's a great example of something that just makes sense, something we've done with our, you know, in different ways with our other types of models that sort of poking at it, perturbing and just seeing what happens, right? Take our initial conditions. Let's just add a little bit of something over here and see what happens, you know, over on the West Coast and see what happens. These are just standard ways that as scientists were taught and that we interact with our models and our data. And I, I think, you know, you calling it brain dead and Amy going, there are fancy words for that in in, in the area, I think is a, just a great example though of how in many ways, what we're do some of what we're doing isn't all that different than before. Um, some, but yeah, I think it's a great point. That was actually the question I was going to ask next, but I, I've decided to ask something different. So no, it's Are great. You? No, you're, I'm not complaining. I think it's great. Um, I, I, I am wanting to make one comment before I jump into the next question. And as there are a couple of questions that are sitting unanswered in Slido, it seems, I think, from some of the audience. And it's because Libby and I are picking the questions we think that are most interesting to the panel as a whole, to the larger scale audience, but there is one question that's sitting in the Slido unanswered, and I'm not gonna ask this to the panel. I'm saying this out loud because I'd like the audience as a whole to go answer it. So there is a question about asking about which universities one should go to to study more about the pipeline. The reason I don't wanna ask it of the panel is you're gonna get the answers from the panel. You might not get, you might get universities that are missed, right? I mean, I clearly would say OU, Libby would clearly say CSU, right? But I think people who are attending should, put some answers into Slido for the person who's asking, because I think it's a great question, but I, I'm moving on, on a different question for the panel. So for the panel, um, uh, Bill Campbell is following up on this question of QC, and I thought it was really interesting. And that is that he feels that, well, I'll just read what he said, because I think that it's a very interesting perspective. And for those who know Bill Campbell, he's the data, he's a data assimilation guru. So uh, as a follow-up, does the bad data have an appropriately large associated uncertainty. From a DA perspective, we always provide an estimate of uncertainty, but not all AI models do. I'd argue QC is relatively easy compared to proper observation uncertainty, specification, and use, especially in the presence of correlated error. Anybody want to respond? Well, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, yeah, just from the notion of, obviously, data availability or training set, uh, obviously you gotta include uh, as as much data as you can. And, and um, you know, one of the things we've talked about, one of the themes that's emerged is this rare event stuff, you know? So as you get into more rare event situations, uh, you know, the data uh, itself becomes thin. And then oftentimes like, you know, I'm thinking about say like radar data for, you know, like tornadic situations, um, the data itself get really messy really quick. So, um, but um, so sometimes, you know, I think it's it's the signal to noise ratio gets a little mixed and and it's tough to tease out what the signal is, especially in these rare event situations. But, um, but I mean, for, you know, other classes of prediction, more typical class of prediction, you know, certainly I think as long as it's in training, training data, then you should be able to handle it. I just say, I think it's spot on. My guess is if you ask Daryl Kleiss, the DA lead at the Environmental Modeling Center, he probably has 80% of his staff working with the observations and the observation quality issues rather than on the data simulation methodological development. Okay, I think it's um, Libby's turn. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Can I bring up a related issue? Um, I was just thinking about work that's been done in risk communication and um, crowdsourcing information in in crisis situations. And so there, it's really important to be able to quality control data because you're getting them from all different kinds of sources. As we think about diversifying the sources of data for weather models, for example, then we'll, there, there will be similar types of issues. So building in quality control and thinking about the quality of the data as a fundamental problem seems really important. Well, I was gonna ask a different question, but Anne, that was a perfect segue into a different one from Slido. So um, 
So we've heard about building trust with users of AI-informed forecasts, but can we use these approaches to better identify unconventional data sources? And you just alluded to that's, that's in the pipeline. It's coming. You can feel it. Um, and so can we use this? Or even if we can't use it, what other unconventional data sources um, might be used for training? And that might be more for Chris and Jason and Tom. So we have these two sides. Um, or again, these two sets of panels that maybe have some thoughts on this. Maybe you can't tell us, maybe these are your your secrets. I, for ex I can give an example. Um, you know, there's, there's things like, uh, uh, well, we know in certain cases, Twitter has been, or, or X, sorry, has been used um, for, I know colleagues of mine thinking about um, fire, or air quality, you know, people commenting on, oh, look how, you know, gross it looks outside, and then that sort of tagging as information um, that they've collected to understand and map out air quality concerns with um, wildfires in places that we don't have particular observations. Um, so may maybe there are examples like that. I don't know if any of you have experience. Well, if we think about air quality and wildfire, I mean, there are purple air sensors, for example, so you can crowdsource data that way, and that's being done in quite a few different places, at least for research. There's, there's also... Um, I mean, historically, there's been a, there have been a lot of what you might call unconventional sources of data. I mean, spotters and people who go out, storm chasers, those kinds of data. And local forecasters do talk about the value of having that kind of observational mm -hmm. data, in, especially when it comes to delivering information to end users. So ways of incorporating those kinds of data sources into AI models seem really important, too. I don't know if it qualifies for unconventional, but you know, I'll name. We already I already mentioned power generation. Um, there's there's data about the sound the tires are making or the grip of tires. There's, um, you know, we have lightning data, but we can also use information about how that data is propagating through the atmosphere. There's all these derivative data sets, or I, I you could consider them unconventional. Um, we also talked earlier about the user input and and kind of helping learn from how the users are incorporating. Um, right now, a simple thumbs up, thumbs down sometimes tells us a lot about the information. Um, there's, so I, I think there's a lot of unconventional data, if that qualifies. Yeah, I think that's great. And also I will point out, um, again, just machine, or many of these AI tools have the ability to ingest data that's not always there right? That's in slightly different formats. We've heard about it allowing us to cross barriers of communication with, across disciplines, which I think is is really great point. And so Scott, yes, to you, you might be like, oh yeah, these are just normal data sets, but these might be hard in the conventional sense to work into one particular, you know, physics-based model that's been around for decades. And so in that sense, um, I think your examples are fantastic in that maybe AI could allow us to make use of that information maybe more easily. I've never heard of the sound of tires on the road. I maybe I'm I'm out of the loop, but that's fascinating. Okay, Amy. Okay. Um, and I think we're going down the data path. I'm gonna ask a question for Bruce Crawford about about all the data processing. This one came up a while ago, I think during the first panel, but it's for anybody who wants to answer. Um Regarding data processing and conditioning for the weather and climate applications, how are data sets made FAIR compatible, where FAIR stands for findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability, and then also explainable AI ready? Everybody's nodding. Everybody agrees it needs to happen. Okay. Anybody want to explain how? Um, no, I, will, I won't, but I'll say... As a upcoming producer of one of these data sets where we're going to generate a reforecast, if you could contact me offline and tell me how I do that so that I satisfy the greatest customer base. Uh, once we've produced the data, I think it's great to get this into as many hands as possible. And by doing this in a way that's sort of known as a community standard, I think that'll facilitate that. So everybody's got their favorite standard, I guess, right? <laughs> um, in terms of the, the type of data they like to work with. Um, I don't know if I can make 
make a ton of comment other than here at EMC, we have to follow WMO guidelines, right? So that's standard. So we have to follow um, all of our data that we send out has to have uh, WMO associated metadata uh, with it in order for it to be like accepted as an official forecast. So in terms of that sense, uh, that's our standard. Uh, whether or not that it's the most uh, fair and accessible and, and everything else is mainly a, a question left up to WMO. Um, but uh, that's the same as we have to follow here. Um, maybe to add, so, so we also follow WMO for many applications. Um, in, in some cases, it's really just driven by the market. Um, for customers who want these for AI applications, they have best practices that they follow that are coming from outside the science industry. And, and so that's not a specific answer, but I, I think that's kind of the idea is it really depends on your application in the end. I mean, we could all agree just to do it in grid two for the rest of our lives, I guess, but yeah. Please no. <laughs> yeah, I, I think underpinning this question is what is a WMO standard is not necessarily the data set that's gonna be most useful to a machine learner training an algorithm quickly and effectively. And so, you know, whether it's czar and what the chunking is of that czar wow. data, Things like that are, are new considerations in this new era of deep learning training. I mean, that brings up this issue of um, metadata standards differ depending, as you just said, Tom, and and but model cards and metadata standards are, are seen by some people as really essential to transparency around models, which then means it's a component of trustworthiness. I'm actually glad you brought that up. I wanna harp on that metadata piece. Um, that is probably, speaking of horror stories, that's probably the source of almost all of my horror stories is, is for example, not knowing that a sensor was mounted three meters off the ground instead of two meters off the ground. It's, it's imperative that that metadata contains the information regardless of what format it's in, in my opinion. I, this is great. And also I'll just point out, you know, unfortunately that's really hard, <laughs> right? Like. Keeping metadata, nobody gets to write a paper on. Look at how all the look at how many hours my graduate students spent putting this metadata together. This this typically doesn't count, and so I think we haven't even talked about um, incentive structures. But I think that this is going to be critical uh, moving forward. Otherwise, that that really important information will be set aside for another day. Right? I'll do it later, and then things will fall apart. So, and thinking again about standards, but actually now instead of the metadata, well, this may be part of your answer, but specifically thinking about the transparency standards or explainability or understanding standards. This is a question from Ryan Harris on Slido. So a large part of trustworthy AI boils down to transparency. So either maybe the panelists could address what transparency standards should we expect from organizations, federal, private sector, I will add academia, when it comes to product services, but also I would just add research. And then adding my own question, how are these different? Or maybe they aren't from what's been required in the past. So not, we're not asking you to set the standards yourself, but are there, given your expertise, are there certain things we should be expecting on transparency and explainability from these tools? Such a simple question. Or maybe that you would like to see. Well, I would argue again. Well, I wouldn't argue this. I'd say that we've heard from many people that's context dependent, right? So I don't. It's not clear that there are transparency standards that would go across all uses and contexts and users. So, um, that's a great point, Anne. Yeah, but I mean, I, I something that most there there are. I mean. NIST has looked at a lot of these, and there are a lot of things that that come up in in a lot of domains. So, for example, people want to know what data have been ingested, and they want to know, like you know, um, um, when were they ingested, and and has you know, or what are the what? Well, Scott wants to know how high the sensors were mounted. So there are some things like that 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 are um, frequently called for, but it's not by everybody for sure. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll no, just, think, uh, um, if, please, oh, sorry. yeah. Yeah, I was just going to add, you know, I think um, obviously peer review publications, I think that's a very effective way to help uh, help in that process of transparency. Um, 
and you know hopefully through that process uh you know if there are elements that are a bit obscure um to to what's going on with the development of a particular model that it's being brought forth and um you know and and, and you know through that process uh that information is known so um, I think that that's a very effective th a tool. I, we've certainly tried to do that at SPC over the years uh, and publish it, you know, certainly through like AMS and other journals as well. So, um, yeah, I just want to throw that out there. I think one of the big challenges is going to be, you know, these schemes are dependent upon very large data sets. So having those very large data sets available in a public place for another person to go in and, um, you know, have an opportunity to verify that the results look reasonable. You know, we need that, but that's a big cost. I think, depending on how long y'all take to answer this one, this may be the last question, we shall see. I'm gonna do this as a round robin. It's a variation of a question that's in Slido. So there's a question in Slido about mm. how do universities and forecasters how do they how are they effectively trained in the current best practices and the use of AI models? The community is really struggling to keep up with what it means to be a meteorologist in the 21st century, which I think is a fabulous question. Um, my question is very specific to each of you is, you know, how do you address that? What would you want in a new hire? And since I know two of you are academics, that could be a new student that you're hiring as well, right? So for the for the government people, what do you want out of your new hires? For the uh, private industry, what do you want out of your new hires? For the government people, what do you want out of your new students? So they can be 21st century meteorologists. And do you, should we just go around? Once I, I'll go, I'll call on you in the order in which you are on my screen, which is that Scott is in the upper left. Um, I was still thinking, but um, <laughs> Randy Posh quote, right? That without the fundamentals, the fancy stuff doesn't work, right? So um, I, I think I think there's a lot of uncertainty in a lot of the answers that you've heard today. And, and we're all thinking through this from the fundamentals that we all know, right? And, and so I think it's, it's almost magnifying how important the fundamentals of our science really are to be able to understand and even address some of these challenges around trustworthiness with AI. Okay, next on my screen is Anne. Well, it's not very often that I would hire a meteorologist, but um, but um, the, the University of Washington is launching a new AI initiative. And among the things that we're considering are what the educational standards should be for incorporating AI. My sense of the discussions to date is that we are going to try to make AI um, tools and educational resources and expectations for understanding the basics of AI much more widespread across the entire university, which means that there will be changes in the in what's going on in the um, in this in the sciences, but D Dale Duran is from the UW, so I mean th that's already changing very rapidly. It's it, I will note before I call on the next person that rapid change in academia is not necessarily a word you normally hear. Academia adapts slowly on purpose, so if you're saying it's changing rapidly. It might not be changing on the scale of Google, but it's still changing quickly for academia. Yeah, it's, it's mind-boggling for the UW. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Will, you are my next uh, square. I also do not foresee myself hiring a meteorologist in the in the foreseeable future as a social scientist. It'd be an interesting position to find myself in. But I will say in general, towards hiring a grad student or someone to help on a project such as these, my ideal focus would be for them to be able to uh, have uh, adaptability in how they're able to utilize AI systems in ways that maybe haven't been considered in the past. I know in overall in academia, there's been a big, a lot of discussion about how do you teach, how, like, how do you assign assignments with essays if your students are just going to have ChatGPT write for them. And so a big focus I've been think, considering is how to adapt assignments towards not having essays, but instead how best to adapt to the utilization of AI to improve the product that people are able to generate. Much like we now all get to walk around with computers or uh, calculators in our pockets, even though our high school math teacher told us we never would. How best to utilize these advances in technology in the product we're able to, able to produce going forward, I think that'd be the area to focus for me personally. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Cross-disciplinary ability, I think is gonna be key. 
if you're an atmospheric scientist, having an ability to talk with uh, somebody who's in machine learning, understand their lingo and translate your own um, to them is, is very important. I agree with that. Chris. Uh, well, um, I'm bringing in a graduate student to work with me this fall who will be doing an AI ML based uh, project. And we have a summer uh, La Penta intern coming in as well. I think that will have an AI ML focus. So I think we're, we're all in <laughs> here uh, in terms of uh, AI ML. So, yeah. But what did you look for to make your, to, to, you know, what flexibility, like Tom's talking about, what did you look for? I mean, yeah, just uh, the same types of things that have been talked about. I think just um, obviously having the cross-disciplinary uh, background, meteorology, computer science, um, the courseworks, you know, across both of those, um, you know, so yeah, just, just that. <laughs> okay, Jason, you want to add anything? Sure. So for here at EMC, at least, uh, I'll certainly agree with all the other panel members that a strong understanding of the fundamentals is necessary for both developing physical-based models or data-driven models. Um, we have folks here who uh, grew up, quote unquote, doing physical-based models, and they are able to uh, translate to doing data-driven uh, models uh, by reading papers and going to conferences and talking with people because they understand the under underlying mathematics. So. At least for here at EMC, it would be essentially the same set of skills that we see for physical base with just the domain knowledge of uh, how to apply AIML to developing uh, data driven models as well. So, pretty much uh, similar skills uh, computer science, mathematics, uh, data science, um, all the similar skills, just being able to translate it to uh, applying it to a different type of problem. Thank you all. Um, Libby, do you want to say any closing words? No, just thank you. This was fantastic, as I had had hoped all along. So I appreciate it so much from all of you. And uh, yeah, I think now, Rachel, if I'm right, we have a break. Is that right? Where'd she go? She's somewhere. She's she's about to put the screen up. There we go. So we're okay, on break perfect. for 13 minutes, it looks like. Um, and then we will see you all back for the final session. Thank you again.
All right, we'll go ahead and get started. All right, I'd like to welcome every bet, everybody back for our last session of this afternoon. Uh, thank you for sticking around. I think we are gonna have a really good session um, where we're gonna think about some of the partnerships that are happening in this space. So we've heard a lot today from individuals talking about what's going on in the AI world from their individual perspectives at agencies, uh, at various companies, in academia. But we, what we really wanna do is highlight the partnerships. And I think what's been really interesting about the conversations that we've been having is the idea that, you know, people keep coming back to this idea that it's a lot similar to what we've done before. Um, and it's not that different than building the NWP that we built in the past uh, in terms of verification and in terms of how we're actually getting products ready for use and trustworthiness. But I think there's a really important context that the, the background setting is very different in the sense that a lot of the advanced uh, advances that we're seeing, the push of technology is really coming from the private sector. So the avenue for partnerships might be a little bit different than it used to be. Um, and so I think that that's what we really wanna highlight in this session uh, this afternoon is highlight the partnerships and how we might need to have a different approach to thinking about some of these topics and highlight some of the successes. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to hand it off to each of our panelists and just uh, a quick reminder that each panelist has five minutes for remarks. Um, and so again, we're like the previous sessions, we're gonna go through all of our panelists uh, in a row and then we'll have 25 minutes for Q&A at the end. So first I would like to welcome our virtual panelists, um, Matt Chantry from ECMWF, and I will let you take it from here. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be there or here, um, uh, virtually at worst. Um, I wish I was there in, in person, but sadly cannot be. And uh, I've really enjoyed today. I found it extremely informative. Um, am I gonna slide, share my slides or are they gonna be shared for me? Sorry, I should have asked this in advance. Uh, your slides will be shared in the room. So when you're ready to go to the next Wonderful. slide. Yes, the next slide, yes. So I'm uh, Matthew Chantry, a machine learning coordinator at ECMWF. And I wanna give my two cents on sort of what makes sort of uh, collaboration possible and perhaps the right thing to be doing to go as fast as possible and to embrace these very exciting opportunities that I think we have for ourselves. Um, and so I wanted to start with, I guess, my view on this question of, why is machine learning progressing so quickly, um, not just in weather forecasting, but across so many different disciplines as which we're all aware of? Sort of um, a lot of people uh, attribute it to better hardware um, sort of allowing us to do more in less time. Um, a, a lot of it, people would also correctly attribute it to new algorithms. Sort of people have been creating um, better optimizers, smarter neural networks um, or, or other such advances. Uh, they might talk to the fact that we're getting better and better at um, building massive data sets and that without data, machine learning is, is certainly um, never going to go anywhere. So, and I think all of those three things are right, but I would actually argue that a fourth is perhaps even more important. And if we move to the next slide, I think it's um, collaboration and development around open source frameworks has really been one of the, the magical uh, ways that the, the technology has moved so quickly. It's enabled to people to stand on one, on one another's shoulders at incredible speed and to sort of not have to necessarily reproduce an algorithm that someone else has, has already written down in a, in, a, in a scientific paper, but allow them to directly use the code and then contribute that back uh, into a, a, a framework like, like PyTorch or TensorFlow. And that this has really enabled the, the research community to move very quickly. It's enabled uh, individual scientists to do incredible things. And I think this is really driving our motivation for how we think we should be approaching this uh, this this scene. So um, next slide, please. Uh, so um, at ECM RubyF, I think we've we've taken advantage of having quite a, 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 a narrow mandate in terms of with the, the, the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecast, so that we have a primary purpose in terms of a, a time scale and, and, and a context of global forecasting. And that's uh, given us a real sense of clarity of saying, we know where we want to go and apply machine learning. We've seen this rise of machine learning being a, a good way of making forecasts. Um, we did some verification and we came to the conclusion that 
We are highly confident this is going to be part of how forecasts are made in the future. We cannot say that they will be completely replacing uh, physics models, but we see that there is um, going to be a certain place for them alongside um, uh, alongside physics-based models. And so we've developed um, a, a machine learning alternate to our physics-based system. So the physics-based system is the IFS, um, and the, the 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 machine learning one is uh, either originally or not originally created called the AIFS. Um, and this we managed to take from quite quick time from concept into reality, partly because of this sort of um, open source work that people have made. So this is about building on top of open source frameworks like PyTorch. It's also about being able to implement sort of clever algorithms that people have had before. So the first version of the AIFS was heavily motivated by GraphCast and some of the other papers that were written in great detail of how you go about implementing it. So next slide, please. So I think we talk about collaboration and there can be sort of many different levels of, of, of scientific collaboration. This could be, and we have this already with, with some partners, so just regular scientific dialogue on the recent discovery and really just success, sharing not only the successes, but also the failures, because I think this is where the most human and computer time is spent, is in the great ideas that didn't actually turn out to be great, great uh, in, in the end. And frequency needs to be high because of these. This can't be about quarterly meetings. It has to be far more active because the speed of progress is so darn fast. One this can also be sort of sharing trained models to allow wider, more detailed testing. So we've seen this already that some of these first papers that produce data-driven weather forecasting models, they made their models open source. It allowed the community to gain faith and trust that these were doing interesting things. They were making plausible forecasts. And you really dare take advantage of how portable these models are. Moving, say, the IFS, so our physics system, from one computer to another takes a phenomenal amount of work. Um, we know this, we're doing this a lot in the Destination Earth project at the moment, but for machine learning models, it can be the work of a matter of minutes. And then the third, and the one that we're really striving for at the moment, is this closest level of collaboration about code-based collaboration for developing and training models. So next slide, please. So we're aiming to build a framework where we have a first version already out that's trying to sit on top of PyTorch, which is one of the, the most commonly used machine learning frameworks, and be a framework for de developing data-driven weather forecasts. So that's its scope. Its scope, sorry. Um, it's about generating machine learning training data sets. We heard a bit about that earlier in the day. I can give my opinion on what makes a machine learning ready training data set. It's about creating some of the state-of-the-art um, graph and transformer-based neural networks and then training and evaluating these models. And our aim is to go fully open source with all of this and then get the community to contribute to it with a fully permissive license. And this is my view of sort of how we how we compete with um, maybe big tech companies or even work with big tech companies is doing everything out in the open and, and getting as many people on board as possible so that individual scientists at the university who wants to take part, can they, can they, can, they can use the code and then make a contribution if they have a new algorithm. Next slide, please. Um, Matthew, we're going to have to uh, move on. Okay. Unless you have one quick thing to say on this slide. I just have one thing, which would prove the concept. We now have a regional model for 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 weather forecasting uh, done with our partners at Met Norway. And I'm very sorry for going over time. I blame the late hour of the evening. <laughs> no worries. Thank you very much, Matt. Okay, we'll move on. Our next panelist is Dan Rothenberg from Open Earth AI. Awesome. I uh, actually can skip my note slide. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I'll try to keep this brief because uh, I think that'll be a, a great uh, conversation here. Um, I wanted to uh, reflect a little bit on my time working in the private sector, particularly with some of these technology companies and technology adjacent ones that have been developing a lot of the technology we've been talking about today. So just to throw this up here, you know, on the left here, I have a slide which is uh, reminiscent of what Amy showed uh, earlier today, kind of tracking the progress of the development of these, of these AI weather forecast models. And what always has struck out to me is that in the modern era we're in, that's all of you know eight to nine months old, a lot of these uh, exceptional innovations have been driven by what I call new innovators in weather and climate. Companies like Google, Nvidia, Huawei, that you don't think of when you think of somebody selling a weather forecast or a weather data service, and yet they've developed this uh, particularly revolutionary technology and continue doubling down on it. Uh, more to that point, at least on the uh, on the domestic side in, here in the U.S., there are a lot of interesting companies working in 
uh, technologies like autonomous vehicles and drones that are developing and deploying at scale, technologies which promise to revolutionize or otherwise change how we sense our built environment and the weather that impacts it. So go to the next slide. Um, just as like a plug for this, this reflects on some work that I did a few years ago at Waymo and has been uh, uh, out in the public. You know, we were uh, reverse engineering things like maps of fog in real time uh, based on observations our vehicles were collecting. And we, we have a, a beautiful blog post about this that I invite uh, people to check out and, and catch up on what Waymo was doing in the weather observation arena more generally. So uh, jump to the next slide. And apologies, I'm going to ask you to click through. There should be five bullet points. You can just throw them up and I'll, I'll keep these brief because I only have another minute or so. Um, one of the things that uh, comes to mind when we think of, you know, how do we actually engage with these new innovators in a way that is productive and constructive for the development and deployment of weather technology is we have to recognize that a lot of these new companies have a very, uh, what I think of as an impedance mismatch with how the traditional weather, water, and climate enterprise tends to operate. So I, I've so, uh, thrown a few uh, quippy statements on the on the board here that I hope uh, uh, people will, will remember. But you know, I think this really breaks down in terms of pace, the models for collaboration, the resources available, the talent that's also a resource, and of course the mission and values. And that mission and value is probably the most important, and in my opinion, and experience the greatest barrier for developing effective collaborations. When we think a lot of these new innovators. Weather and climate applications are secondary or derivative to a lot of what they're doing. You know, when we thought about weather challenges for Waymo, we didn't go about thinking, how can we build the world's greatest observation system for urbo, urban microclimate and, and weather analysis? It was just a consequence and a side effect of the other mission, which was to safely transport people and goods uh, anywhere autonomously. And that's a very different mission that motivates what arguably a lot of the people in the room today and listening have, which is we're solving weather and climate so uh, problems for society. And this impedance mismatch is at the heart of almost all of the barriers I've ever found in terms of collaborating with these new tech companies that have this incredible capabilities and resources. And those of us who are thinking, you know, how can we uh, more effectively leverage the tech to have big change? Everything falls down from that when we think about the resource imbalance and inequity. Yes, it is true that companies like NVIDIA have seemingly unlimited access, not only to elastic computational resources, but human resources to go uh, with it. Uh, whereas on the, you know, the traditional weather enterprise, obviously we have long procurement cycles, different processes that add time and add friction or inertia otherwise. And again, that just stems because a lot of these tech companies, they have this model of moving fast and breaking things. Uh, they want to build things independently, prove that they can do it. Uh, come up with new solutions to problems, and that uh, leads them to going it alone more often than not. So in, in my experience and the, the thought I would uh, leave uh, for the audience to reflect on, in which we can uh, discuss more with the complete panel, is that understanding who is on the other side of the table when you're building these collaboration partnerships, what motivates them, what gets them out of bed, what will get them interested in your problems, you have to approach it anew and understand that in many cases, we're working with people that don't have skin in the weather and climate game, and they might be very interested and have enormous capability to make a huge difference, but you do need to go back to square one and motivate and build those relationships and partnerships if you want them to be successful. So with that, I'll pass it to the next panelist. Thanks. Um, our next panelist is Ryan McGranahan from NASA JPL. Thank you so much. And I, I do want to just tie into some of the things I want to say, but I just do want to draw attention. We, we tend to place focus on the speakers, but the moderators today have done a phenomenal job and even more behind the scenes, the people who put together this meeting. So thank you for that. It's really important to the topic of this panel, which is generating partnerships. So uh, I want to talk about a few things and it's kind of well placed at the end of today to be a little bit provocative. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, the degree of interconnectivity of our systems means that we can't really simply disconnect the pieces that are very important. And very importantly to what we're discussing, you can't disentangle the physical systems from the social structures and the cultural structures that exist within them. And so when you start to talk about these problems that were faced, it, faced the term wicked is often used. These are resistant to final articulation. You've heard a lot of discussion today about needing to continually learn uh, something in order to trust it. And a final, they're resistant to a final resolution and they include social complexity. So we really need to think about the human element, the social and behavioral sciences, which I know many of the speakers today have been involved in thinking about. So if you go to the next slide, I think what I wanna draw attention to is that when we're thinking about the earth system, 
not only the, the climate system, but also how it interacts with the space environment and how you grow the complexities by the complexity of the system by including more elements. This is a proving ground for how we actually do this. And so it's, a, it's an extreme environment uh, in figurative and literal senses. And we need to, to think about how we include the social element in, in responding to this. Uh, so please go to the next slide. Um, there's this wonderful quote, and I won't read it up here, but I will draw attention to the final sentence of it. Um, this is a great report. It's actually on display in the lobby here. But bringing together scholars from diverse fields to collaborate meaningfully has been and remains fraught with difficulty. And so I think that this is kind of alluding to this topic we discussed earlier about what are the literacies that are needed within our community uh, to address some of these things. And some of the literacies that may be uh, lacking are ones uh, about facilitation, about how do you lead a team of interdisciplinary scholars? How do you actually do that? And how do you then trace that to be able to make that legible so someone who does a really good job of that, that they're, they're respected for that and that they're incentivized to do that in the future? Um, that's a challenging problem. And I don't know that we have a great answer to that, but I do wanna bring it here as a point of discussion. Next slide, please. And I'll move this along pretty quickly. I think we can learn a lot of this from the field of natural resource commons and more recently knowledge as a commons itself. I think the commons is a very important idea for conceptualizing many of the problems we're talking about in this room and that we're facing today. There's a Nobel laureate, Eleanor Austin, who's done phenomenal work uh, in this book called Governing the Commons. She came up with eight design principles that said, how can we effectively govern commonly held resources? And then it's telling that she turned her attention towards the end of her career to knowledge of the commons. How does this change as we move into digital spaces and, uh, and some of these things that we're developing now? I think there's a lot of other things to learn there. If you go to the next slide, some of the dimensions I think are very important are social capital, collective action, self-governance, um, these are things that come out in prominence in this, and I, I would like to raise them as, as dimensions for our discussion today. And then I'll move on to the next slide. Um, I think open science is a place where some of these things are being developed, thought about uh, muscularly and robustly. And if you go, if you just click through to the, ne the next slide here. Um, I think this is telling, it's kind of identifying some of the pillars of the knowledge commons that we need to consider. And uh, it includes two elements intelligent and accessible data infrastructure and the platform to utilize it. So touching on that element of machine learning ready, artificial intelligence ready data and software. And then this very important cultural element of a participatory ecosystem of knowledge sharing, governance and trust. And this governance component of how we govern our models, govern our teams, govern our, our solutions to these problems and how we're speaking about them is particularly challenging, and particularly important. I think together, if you go to the next slide, uh, this is a knowledge commons. Um, if you go to the next slide, I'll talk about one project, one area where I think is very important, it's, called, it's network science. And this is something we learned from the sociological sciences that's very important. One element of a knowledge commons is we need to create improbable connections, the ones that wouldn't otherwise happen. If you go back to the most cited paper in all of social sciences, it's Mark Granovetter's The Strength of Weak Ties. How important these acquaintance level ties are to innovation, diffusion of knowledge, uh, and pr producing improve, uh, cl improved collaborations. Uh, if you go to the next slide, and, and I know I'm running out of time here, but I'll, I'll, go, I'll talk about something we're doing at, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory called the Science Understanding of Data Science. This is our conceptualization and our, our major internal initiative that we're now trying to grow into a multi-institutional initiative of how do we start to do this? How do we create improbable connections? How do we put data scientists who are capable of developing these solutions in touch with the physical scientists who know the problem itself? And the goal of this project is to increase the speed, depth, and rigor of scientific return by revealing new connections through data science. So it's really trying to put that to the test. Um, and in the next slide, um, I think one area that we can do, uh, make some progress in, and we're actually seeing some exciting work in, is making some of these things that are traditionally not visible more legible to the scientific community. So I'll draw your attention to the science of science. There's a really wonderful paper I'm pointing to here, which I, I can't describe in detail, but I will say it talks about the idea of a research expedition of how you take a, a method that's been developed for one purpose and bring it into a new domain, communicating it there and how impactful that can be and actually how it has led to breakthrough science. So I'll leave it with that and I'd love to, to engage with everyone on the discussion. Okay, super. Thank you very much, Ryan. Our next speaker will be John Kreider from Kreider Consulting. Thanks. Facilitating partnerships across sectors. You know, it's really easy to get excited about this. And as technical people, we wanna jump into right away, what can we do, how do we do it? And I think it's really important to step back and first ask the question of why, why a partnership? So keep that in mind, I'm gonna come back to that at the end. In my experience, it's not a surprise that government, industry and academia typically do not play well together. 
I believe it's largely, largely because you have different cultures and motivations and partnerships, frankly, are hard. I'm gonna make three recommendations to promote partnerships between organizations. Recognize cultural differences among sectors and build on strengths. Identify partnerships as an organizational priority and empower our champions. Prioritize and use transparent two-way communication. For each recommendation, the slides will describe five attributes. And before I leave this, I'll just ask you to note the quotation at the bottom of this in orange by Admiral Rickover. This is what has to happen to make partnerships a reality. We need courageous impatience because as I said, partnerships are hard. Next slide, please. First is to recognize differences among sectors and build on respective strengths. I like to highlight the green font. Industry has a culture of execution while NOAA tends to be risk averse. Industry is willing to delegate authority. Government, not so much. Think about contracts and the program management infrastructure being completely different. Industry is motivated by profit. A lot of government employees think this is bad. Industry tends to go for good enough, sort of a ready fire aim attitude, while NOAA tends to look for perfect. One other aspect, the government cannot be seen to show favoritism. It has to be fair to all. So it makes it hard. Um, a potential example for AI for weather would be to have industry AI as subject matter experts collaborate with NOAA weather SMEs. For a variety of reasons, a lot of which we've heard today, I think the majority of AI expertise will reside in industry, while the majority of weather expertise will be at NOAA. So cross-sector partnerships could be helpful, but it's the question of why do these cross-sector collaboration? If I'm a weather expert in NOAA, should I, can I just go work with people in NOAA? What, why should I reach out to industry when it's so hard. Next slide. Second, I believe NOAA should identify partnerships as a priority and empower a NOAA champion. Again, call your attention to the green font here. In my experience, without a champion, day-to-day -day tasks seem to get in the way. A complex organization of committees looks impressive on paper, but it only confuses things. When I worked at Oceaneering, we differentiated between what we call a working group and a team. A working group is people getting together, talking about common objectives. What do you think? What do you think? And then they go their separate ways. A team has a common objective and they're required to work together to do something. The champion could be an individual or it could be a small team, but what's critical is that they're accountable for execution they have the authority to prioritize resources and to say, no, stop doing this and focus on doing X. Most important, they need courageous impatience to make things happen. I've seen this work well in the US Navy submarine force in the past. I think there's a great opportunity here for a champion to form the NOAA data hub that we've been talking about. It's, there's been a persistent demand for data I think everybody sees the value in it. There's no technical challenges, but day-to-day -day work just plain gets in the way. We need a champion who has clear accountability for this as a must do. Next slide. And finally, it's essential to prioritize and use transparent two-way communication. This is an essential element to build trust. I've seen this work really well at NASA in the past where a previous administrator formed a round table of about 30 industry leaders and regularly met for candid discussions. Maybe a similar approach for this topic, I don't know. But regardless of the approach, it's critical to develop a clear understanding of what NOAA will and won't do and the expected timing and vice versa. I note that Dr. Um, Gearnart from DOE this morning said it'll be really helpful just to know what's coming from industry. Once again, transparent two-way communication takes concerted effort. So you have to make sure that the value justifies the effort. So I said on my first slide, I'd come back to the question of why at the end. And this is the one point that I'd like to, you to take away from this. 
I really believe cross-sector partnerships are hard and it requires major efforts in order to work. So before you jump into how you're gonna to work together, be clear on why. Knowing this, is the partnership worth it? Both parties have to be able to one, clearly define why they wanna do it and understand their partner's reason. Second, recognize that major cultural differences exist. And third, be willing to commit the resources and empower a champion in order to make it work. Thank you. Thank you, John. And uh, we will turn to our last panelist who is online, Angel Fargell from uh, the IUCRC working on fire weather uh, from San Jose State University. Uh, hello, everybody. So, in my, so uh, what, I'll, what I'll be doing is basically giving an example of one of those partnerships um, as a in my experience as a postdoc on uh, the Welfare Interdisciplinary Research Center. So you can go to the next slide. So uh, what the Welfare Interdisciplinary Research Center is, is an NSF, uh, National Science Foundation Industry University Cooperation Research Center. And I'll, I'll share with you in a couple of um, uh, slides what that entails. But just before going into that, um, basically how an, uh, one of those Welfare Interdisciplinary Research Centers are defined is first they have uh, common um, mission. And this sense, our mission is to improve welfare knowledge, welfare uh, um, uh, science, um, um, to not only uh, improve uh, the policies for community and industry stakeholders around the world, but also to be able to develop new tools that can be used uh, for also industry, manage the assets for in industry manage, ma management, and then also everything on a changing climate. So the first thing to build the Welfare Interdisciplinary Research Center or an interdisciplinary research center in general is that you want to attack a lot of different areas uh, of expertise. And in this sense, here I'm just showing a list of them. And um, our group, which is the fire modeling group, um, is mainly focusing on, on the two first ones, the fire dynamics and behavior and the fire weather. Uh, but normally you want to attack as many topics as you can to be able to uh, resolve complex problems. And uh, just to finalize the outcome of a center like that is to gain knowledge on the welfare science, improve prediction tools and risk models, and also at the end, if possible, get better uh, community resilience policies um, that are research driven. So if you can go to the next slide. So in general, uh, what the WIRC or Welfare Interdisciplinary Research Center is, is an NSF uh, IUCRC, Industry University Cooperative Research Center. And what it means is it has two main goals. One is to bring uh, research into operations. And the second goal to also train a diverse workforce. Um, so the idea is, as I mentioned, um, all those different areas of uh, knowledge, they, they need to be all talking to each other uh, in a common space. And that's what the center is. And, um, and then this institution as a whole also needs to be uh, in, co in constant communication with industry and federal partners. And everything is all put together um, for, from a national perspective. So here I'm just showing the, our industry and federal partners um, or what we call IAB members. And, um, and that those are basically what, or uh, it's where the funding comes from. So now if you go to the next slide, We'll dive a little bit more into uh, what an IUCRC is. So uh, next slide, please. Good. So the idea is there is a group of uh, private sector and, and government, government institutions that they uh, fund um, the, the center. And the idea is that they get only a 10% university overhead. So that's, that's, um, um, that's one of the good incentives uh, from their side. And then there is a pool of membership fees. And there's the, those membership fees, what they have is, okay, they have both, um, um, they have votes to vote on projects and also to attend the meetings. And then they have access to all uh, the research and, and all the tools that have been built out of those projects. So if you go, if you click again uh, to get more information on the slide. And in our side, we have the university, which provides infrastructure, talent, intellectual capital, and uh, also, um, the venue to get all those IB members together in the same room. And then if you click again, everything gets uh, in this kind of um, middle bridge uh, funded by NSF to, that pays for the center administration. And if you click again, 
Um, the idea is that is to create research projects that can benefit uh, both uh, worlds, so can be a bridge between um, uh, early stage development and commercial deployment. And at the end, um, this, uh, the center um, can provide uh, those different values. So, so if, you, if you can go ahead, I'll just try to wrap it up. So this is just to show how many people get to, to, to have a center like that. This is just all the people involved only on the fire modeling team. Um, and there are a lot of other teams on the center. And, um, and so it, it needs a lot of people. And then if you go to the next slide um, and just click a couple of times, this is just um, more, more, a little bit more times. Uh, one more, okay, here you go. So here is just to show like what type of complex problems we want to solve. And um, that put together a lot of resources from a lot of different places and, and then, then can help drive different decisions. And now, uh, thanks to having this um, Wildfire Interdisciplinary Research Center, we are also starting to uh, look into how AI can help on many of those problems. And um, here I'm just showing some of the, uh, or highlighting some of the current AI projects that we are working on as part of those projects that IAB members uh, fund. And then I just wanted just to finalize my, um, my speech, just saying that um, this also builds collaboration in the sense that then we have also projects with the same IAB members outside of the Wildfire Interdisciplinary Research Center um, as part of the university, just because we build some trust around uh, what we do. And also we have other projects with uh, governmental institutions like NASA and NSF that also bring uh, a, lot of, a lot into the table. So we try to be in the middle of, of, um, of all those worlds. So yeah, that's, that's the end of my speech. All right, thank you. So uh, we're gonna turn to some Q and A with our panel, um, and I'd like to start with a question uh, to Matthew. If you're still on, hopefully we can get his camera on. Um, but the question, as this is happening, uh, the question is: You mentioned open source by the end of 2024. Um, so can you speak to how you see folks who lack the computational resources? Uh, you mentioned academics or about using training, uh, contributing to your models and data. And so I wanna preface this, that this is a question directed at Matthew, but I think the question is generally can be applied to everyone and thinking about access uh, to the models and data and open source framework. So how do you see that as part of the collab collaborations uh, across sectors? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. And I think the, the answer is gonna be giving some minimal data sets that have been demonstrated to give useful starting starting guesses. So you won't be able to get to right at the bleeding edge with a smaller data set. So here I'm thinking about operating on a reduced resolution across the globe or perhaps a, a small uh, limited area region to do some modeling and make a, a develop a, a minimal setting that allows people to get to a good model uh, and good enough to test their theory on what might work well. Um, so that's something that's on our, our roadmap to try and understand where the minimal problem will be. I know Dale Duran has done some really nice work on this on his so-called uh, parsimonious uh, uh, deep learning for, for numerical weather prediction. He's got it down to seven variables and a rather coarse grid. So that's a good place to aim for as well. Uh, just to add to that, it's also worth pointing out that the ability to run inference and actually test and, and work with these tools is much, much less computationally demanding than say training a model from scratch. And as we've discussed on a couple other panels already today, there's extraordinary value in getting these tools in the hands of users or people who can create products for users, even if it's just creating model maps or, or new animations to share with new communities. So I'm actually really optimistic that the work that Matt's team and a lot of other folks are doing uh, will really help us get ahead of some of these trustworthiness issues that we've seen, even if they're not necessarily enabling everyone to train a bleeding edge model from day one. I'm actually going to go back to uh, an earlier question in some of the earlier discussion with some of the federal agencies. And Kevin Reed said, that, you know, we had several examples of partnerships across federal agencies, but most of these are at the individual PI level. Uh, is there a need for a larger coordinated effort? And I guess if you broaden that out, as far as, you know, we've all talked about how difficult these different partnerships 
are across agencies with private industry. Where is the optimal point of contact? Does it vary? Where does it, should it start? Should it grow bottoms up, top down? Thoughts on just how do we really get these seeds growing uh, effectively? Well, I'll say, yeah, I think you need a spectrum of approaches. There's certainly different areas that, that need the, the different scale of partnership, um, but just kind of going to the, 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 the widest scale, kind of the community effort. I mentioned kind of self-organization, how um, we need that element of it for some of these wicked problems. If you point to some of the successes from the software and even the AI sharing communities, uh, places like the Apache Software Foundation, these are very much community driven and they've been outstanding in terms of their success and their uptake and how they've been models for governance by community in this space. So I think that those are places we can turn to to learn from. And then there's things like Hugging Face where uh, very much there, this is a community driven platform of sharing AI models. Uh, it's it just, it, it's, it's everywhere, it's ubiquitous. Um, it's been extraordinarily impactful in terms of spreading the use of, of AI models. And so these are examples that we can point to from those, those levels of kind of grassroots community level efforts um, that we could work towards and start to cultivate in our community. I think it's important to have relationships at all levels. If you're talking about a partnership, uh, it's easier at an individual PI level for two people to get together and start to talk to each other and they reach some sort of a partnership. It's harder from a top-down perspective um, but if you really want to take on a meaningful project or something that's bigger in scale, it requires that top-down effort, and um, it requires the leader of the organization to say, yes, this is something that's really valuable, and I'm willing to commit time to make it happen. All right, um, along those lines, uh, I'm going to go to this question about uh, the IUCRC model and thinking about that. Um, and it's really this idea of uh, you're collaborating with industry, it's supported by NSF, it involves a lot of academics. This seems like a really great model. Um, from your experience in this IUCRC, uh, how would you envision something like this growing in scale to be larger than it is uh, just with you know your specific wildfire, do you do you see successes? Do you see hurdles? Um, and then also expanding into these other collaborations that are already happening, um, how do you see them growing and expanding to more of a enterprise-wide initiative? So I guess the, um, what what I like about um, this model of this IUCRC model, and I think probably the AI for weather would benefit from that, is um, to put together also different uh, um, inst different institutions and also uh, private uh, like companies that that they all have kind of common like similar um, 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 I would say uh, goals. So bring them together in the same table, and then they realize that they are all actually facing the same problems, the same limitations. Um, so so that really uh, in our experience, that really I think helped them also. Um, I would say play nicer between them, um, also bring resources between them uh, uh, better. Um, and, and then I think ultimately that advances the science better. Um, so I, I don't know how that would apply in a larger scale in, in AI for weather, and we can discuss that further. But I think this is one of the main um, things that make this collaboration work better is that all those private um, companies, they realize, oh, we have the same limitations. And if we work together and we, combining the same uh, plays and, and, and focus on working together, that, that will make a big difference. Thank you. I'm going to go to a question that actually derives from John, your earlier comment, where you really you started to impose or the, the question why. And Kevin Reed asks, you know, can, can all of the panelists really speak to, to answering that question? Why do we need these private sector, public, you know, public, private sector, public sector relationships? And yeah. so we could just kind of run down the table and then to virtual. You want to? Speak? 
I guess John. Can. Okay. Uh, um, I think doing it, if you build on the different strengths that different organizations or different sectors bring, it's possible to achieve things that you can never do working independently. I mean, that's the, the fundamental, why should you do it? But I, I think it's really important if two people are exploring a partnership to sit down and say, here's why it's important to me and to listen to the other person so that you can articulate and ask questions about why is it important to you? And I think both partners have to understand um, not only what the other partner is bringing to the table, but why it's important to you. I think specifically when we think about this in terms of AI and weather forecasting, um, you know, to build on John's point, we can accomplish so much more if we're finding effective ways to work together and pooling our resources and the skills that the different sectors bring to the table um, that I, I think about this purely in opportunity cost. I really do believe a lot of the technology that's being developed right now and which we'll see published you know, by AGU and AMS are fundamentally going to change some of the ways we think about not only weather forecasting and climate services, but how do we connect value to many, many diverse stakeholders. And I simply think that if uh, we go our separate ways and we let each sector go, you know, say academics go one way and the Googles of the world go another, I personally don't believe we'll achieve anywhere near the value that we could if we find effective ways to work together on these problems. Yeah, and I'll just kind of resonate with, with what's been said. Um, you know, the world is the, the world that we're studying, uh, this system is bigger than, than any one individual mind. It's bigger than any one individual organization. You know, then you spoke about impedance mismatch. I think that's part of the value. Of, of collaboration and we've talked about diversity about the importance of democratizing science if we actually take that to its core it's like well, what is democracy it's, it's valuing plurality and diversity for the improvement of the ideas for the improvement of the flourishing of a society and the flourish, flourishing of a science requires that same level of interaction and that that doesn't happen when we stay within our silos so we can keep doing the science and, and the, the ways that we're thinking about the systems that we have or we can introduce that kind of creative tension that will move it forward in ways that are that are challenging and costly. I mean, there's information costs and there's there's these impedance costs uh, that we have to address, but that's part of it. It's that friction of coming to that new understanding that, that, you, that you wouldn't have been able to come to on your own. So that, that's that's the why for me. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Matt, do you have anything to add on the importance or why do we need these relationships of partnership? It, it only gets hard to answer these questions, right? As I've had so many good answers go ahead of me. So I, I feel bad for Angel who have even less. I think I just to build on uh, what 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 Daniel said, I think I, I think that resonated a lot with me. I think there are just so many open questions at the moment about how we go about building the best possible models, and so collaborating at scale is the best way to go about answering them as quickly as possible. And I think we have a, a duty to do that. But I, I think as a, as a, as a maybe against this partnerships, we want to do this all very quickly, right? And we can all get bogged down in spending a lot of time forming these partnerships. So I think we should try and do it, but only if we can do it quickly, because otherwise we will lose out to the large enough groups who can go in alone and do this. So it's got to be a balance. Partnerships will be great, but only if they can be achieved in a relatively short space of time. And I think that'll be about being really clear on what, what both parties want and, and if there's a possibly open source model to allow you to achieve that. And yeah, I mean, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to say that I really agree with everything that has been said, and it's difficult to add more. <laughs> but I, I would say that probably um, another thing that is very, um, or th that works really well for us, is also when those why questions also are coming from the different projects. So basically, you you also divide the problem in pieces. So you don't you don't have to ask, answer those questions of why, like in a general, like very general, like they say AI for weather. But you actually uh, cut it down in pieces of what you what projects or what what uh, areas you want to um, to be, to uh, specifically want to answer this question about why uh, into and um, and we found that probably the answer is very different for different areas uh, of different projects and 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 then you can build better um, understanding uh, from that. And sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> Oh, that, that was my, my fault, my apologies. I just want to mention one more, one more uh, point on this, which is um, if we kind of understand that all these different scales are needed, 
I think the importance lies in the knowledge of when to transition between the scales of interaction. So you, you don't want every every idea being thrown in. There's a there's a time for divergent thinking, and then and there's a, a critical point at which you transition into a different form of thinking. And you know, I think that this is important in, in terms of navigating this research to operation cycle that we've spoken about. And then also, if you kind of look at the technology readiness life cycle and the application readiness life cycle, it's important to know the transition points uh, when your specific group, your specific context is ready to go into a different form of collaboration. Uh, that, that's a challenge too. I think that's a really good point. And it also echoes one of the, the next questions is this idea that there's a transition point and sometimes you have to know your readiness level and when you're ready to, to go live with something versus not. So uh, this question comes from one of our panelists earlier today, uh, Sengdar Lee from NASA. And this question was specifically for Daniel, but I think anybody can answer it. Uh, and it's this idea that, you know, they've had, he's had partnerships with labs and companies, um, and it's been really fast paced with developments and deliveries, but there's always the fear that the V and B isn't enough. Um, so thinking about this, how do you, how do you know the quality of the work when it is fast paced and maybe you're used to going a little bit slower and how can we work as a, you know, enterprise to really hit those marks. And, you know, can you talk about that? Yeah, I, I can, I can uh, start speaking to that. I'm sure the rest of the panelists had perspective as well. Um, one lesson I can share is that it's vital to as, as much as possible to find su uh, success criteria and go, no go decision points and all the inputs needed to feed into those processes uh, upfront and as soon as possible. Now, no one's clairvoyant. You can't know every piece of information that you might need for a particular decision down the line, but there's a lot that you can know and there's a lot that you can do to put firm constraints and boundaries so that it's less of a question of, uh, you know, a worry that there's a significant QC miss or there's a total misalignment in, in the final deliverable and more so along the lines of it's sort of fine tuning uh, when you get to the point of transitioning to a customer, transitioning to operations um, or whatever. So this is a cultural problem that if you're very deliberate about you can't entirely eliminate, but you can dramatically reduce the risk and how it might actually impact that decision point later on. I agree with what Daniel said. I think it's also important to understand the consequences of being wrong. Um, you know, tech industry moves really quickly with personal devices and their attitude is we'll fix it in the next version if it's wrong. Completely different perspective if you're talking about doing a forecast for a hurricane where people's lives are at stake. Um, so it's a different kind of standard of quality and perfection. Just add on top of that, because I, I agree 100% 100 with John, that's actually exactly why you need to have these discussions at the beginning of collaborations and understand where you're going. You can't get to the last mile when there's a completely different set of pressures that could very likely come into direct conflict with the sort of uh, first do no harm type mentality that, that certain stakeholders might care about. Okay, I'd like to move on to a question actually for Angel, specific to Angel. And that is probably there are very few of these different efforts we've talked about where there are more boots on the ground than firefighters. You have a whole force out there in the in the wildfire and there is like where you have fire bosses and you have the people out fighting the fires. Do you do you how close have you brought them into this discussion and your trustworthy trustworthy AI uh, piece? How how do you how do you, do you feel like you've got there with it? No, it wasn't. <laughs> Angel, did you hear the question? Uh, well, yes. <laughs> can you can you repeat it just just to yeah to be a little more clear? Thank you. <laughs> I'll shorten it. A trustworthy AI and and in your wildfire uh, work as far as how do you see any resistance or sense to the fire bosses and the people out fighting fires? Do they care? Do they believe in it? How and how closely do you work with them? Yeah. So basically. Um, what always, what almost always happens is that um, the final decision is never made by those models or by those systems, right? Those are just complementing what the, what the experts in the field 
um, really believe that it's going to happen, or be, really believe that what 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 it what what they should how they should uh, manage their resources. So we always post everything that we do as a complement, never as a that's what you actually need to follow. Um, and uh, and I think that's very important to have this limitation, this um, de delineate this this uh, boundary because um, um, even if you are very trustworthy of uh, what the model um, uh, is telling, at the end of the day, um, what what matters? Uh, I mean, it's very difficult to um, to to, um, to 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 make the go ahead when it's something that it's as um, sensitive as going into a you know going into a fire, know what the consequences can be, and 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 all that. So, so at the end of the day, we just want to help them make the the right decision. That's that's all that we that we um, ambition to. Quick follow up. Do you have a good? You have people out there with 10, 20, 30, 40 years of experience where they sort of probably have their own sense about what's going to happen. Do you feel you're making inroads and in developing that that trust and belief that they're making decisions based on your input, or are they still going back to gut? Yeah, that's uh, that's a yeah, that's a good question. It's it's difficult to tell because um, um, I mean there are always success and failure stories. Um, well, while while you are modeling or when you are doing uh, advances, right? And the advances normally are quicker than 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 the the trustworthiness of of um of the you know person that has the thirty years of experience. So um so it's right that technology is evolving really fast, but how we make it um how how we make it uh, I would say reliable. Uh, that's uh, that's actually a very like a more slowly um, a, a process because they really need to be uh, to have a lot of success stories, a lot of um, you know you don't you, you don't need only statistics and say okay that that works better. It actually needs to to be built up from experience. Um, so so that that's not going to be something that will happen overnight just because your root mean square error is lower. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll build on that. We've done some work, and this is a little different context, but just studying uh, the, the resiliency of power grid to various natural hazards and, and trying to understand what was very important in that product was to understand who was talking to who when, when an event occurred. And people rely naturally on their relationships. And so we wanted to understand who are they talking to and who are they trusting in this process of responding. And one of the things we borrowed from sociological literature was the idea of a boundary navigating object, which is something that allows people to gather around and speak the same language around. And what we did was design a simulation game, and this has been used across the natural hazard sector, but we designed a simulation game that, that kind of put model data in front of them and presented it to them like they would see it in an actual event was playing out, like they were looking at their dashboard or looking at, like, doing what they were going through in their jobs. And we observed who they talked to and what, what they would do. And we had these, these discussion se sessions and it was, it was illustrative in terms of kind of what they were trusting, what they were relying on, and the opportunities to say, here's where they would actually trust a data source that they didn't have, or here's where we could put into in some, some kind of platform that would, would uh, speak to a gap that they, they perceived or some uncertainty that they had in the system. And then the, the final point was just that it's it critical to, and I don't think this is news to anyone, but it's critical to include uncertainties on that. Robust uncertainties that, that can be reasoned about and traced, uh, that, that's absolutely vital to to that process as well. All right, so we are nearing the very end of our time. So I would like to thank our panelists, but I would like to give you all one opportunity to give your last one or two sentence thoughts uh, on really building partnerships and, and looking forward um, in the future of AI and weather. So if you can do it in one sentence, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll just leave it with a question that I'm always thinking about, which is just, just like, if we, if we think about the science that we're trying to do, what does it mean for that science to flourish? You know, if we challenge ourselves to be more, more than just surviving with the science that we're doing, more than just doing the status quo, if we were thinking about kind of expanding and growing and, and, and flourishing science, what is that, what does that call to mind, what we think about? So I don't have an answer to that. It's just something that makes me think. I'll, I'll be a little on the cliche side. Um, again, I think there's uh, incredible new opportunities uh, on the horizon with this technology. And that also means there's a new opportunity for new epistemic communities and communities of practice to achieve them. So um, let's at least give it a try and see what happens and circle back in two years and debrief what went wrong. 
or went well? I'll just build on the theme of uh, trying to define upfront expectations on both sides as best you can, um, because that's what's going to define success. And it's much better to do that in the beginning before you put in a huge amount of effort on both sides. Yeah, my, my version is very similar, but it's about assessing sort of how well are our goals aligned um, and, and how we can better align them or, or whether we should just uh, go our separate ways. Yeah, and I wanted to say very similar things. So basically, try to find the common ground and just and, and trying to try, try to uh, bring uh, the knowledge together to to, to solve um, the same problem that, that we all face, like in, in my now my example wildfire in in others other other examples all right thank you I think we're ready to move on to our synthesis and closing remarks. Just a few minutes. So we are ready. We'll, we'll we be very ready. fast. Okay. Amy, you're up. Actually, Libby's up first, then me. Oh, Libby's up. I'm sorry. You're right. Libby. Okay. So Amy and I were frantically taking notes all afternoon. Um, it was nearly impossible to summarize all of the things discussed, but um, we've decided to sort of split across myself, Amy and Brad, some sort of big takeaway thought um, from so many of the wonderful discussions we've just had. So the first here is sort of data and training. So the need for big data to train AI has put data and data creation at the forefront. We heard quite a bit about that actually at the beginning and then here at the end, essentially dramatically increasing that data's value, but governing, governing that data access um, issues with intellectual property when we talk about these collaborations um, and connections of this common sort of area is critical. And then a question with, I think, an ever-evolving answer, which we heard about quite a bit from our panelists today, was how and when should we be treating AI models differently than other computer-based models? Many panelists spoke to doing sort of the same things they were doing before with more focus on AI um, as the application, but I think we also heard a few examples of, of new issues coming up um, or new concerns that have to be tackled. Another um, relating to trustworthiness and trust, which we heard quite a bit about, especially um, in the middle session today, is that trustworthiness is maybe not as simple as we wanted it to be, right? We put it in our one of our titles uh, and um, uh, it turns out, uh, or it, the panelists discuss, it's context and problem and person dependent. And really is this blanket term that's covering a wide range of approaches, which, um, and I think Ann Bostrom brought up, furthermore, it's inherent, inherently emotional and subjective. Um, so that means that building and defining trustworthy AI, even though we use it as this single thing that we talk about, um, it's not gonna have one way of doing it or one answer. So we really need to be ready to spend the time on this. This is not gonna be something we, we sort of write a report and have the answer and then just give it out. Um, and then finally, and I know this feeds into um, where Amy's going to be discussing, is thinking about the workforce. So there were a lot of discussion on the challenges with maintaining and recruiting talent, given the strong pull from industry. Um, and, and again, or given the strong pull, I should say, in one direction. Um, can we learn from other fields, disciplines on how to tackle this um, as I, AI in academia, at least, um, is struggling? And so this is just an example of you know, there are other fields that dealt with this, this push and pull decades ago. I think about many aspects of engineering and can we learn from those folks and how they have um, sort of kept academia alive and, and, and relevant in the workforce world um, since we're, many of us are dealing with this today. So Amy, go ahead. My dog chose this, just this moment to bark at the people who are outside. So now there's a dog in my lap. So she's going to help us with the closing remarks. Um, and so Libby and I were, you know how hard it is to listen to everything and think deeply and moderate a session and come up with slides at the same time? It's interesting. So Libby and I both picked up on this education theme. And what I decided to do for my slides is just list a, a list of the questions that kept coming up throughout the day. 
So focusing on how we retrain and retain our workforce. And one of the things that I think Libby just mentioned about learning from the other disciplines, you know, the idea of, ret of retaining our workforce is not necessarily new. It may be new to AI, but it's not necessarily new in general. Engineering for a very long time has been able to do what better by leaving academia and get paid in industry. Um, but it's something that we need to learn from them about how we can address this. Because if everybody leaves academia, then there won't be anybody to train the new students for the next generation. So that could be a problem. And I also thought that the comment about how do we get enough knowledgeable reviewers for a paper or a grant, et cetera, needed to be highlighted because that really focuses on the workforce retraining. It isn't just all of our brand new students that we're trying to train for people to be hired, which was the question we asked in our panel. Um, and then I think the question of how do we adapt education so the students are marketable and adaptable to a rapidly changing world is also important. The reason that education changes slowly is that you don't want to go with every fad but we also need to be able to produce students that are adaptable. Um, and then uh, jumping onto this last panel, we talked about partnerships throughout the day. So some of these points came up earlier in the day, but also in this last panel, how do we best enable these agencies to actually work together? I heard a concerning statement this morning that one agency wouldn't fund a project if, if it used data from another agency. And I found that very concerning because that's not gonna help us drive that science forward that we need to do. So how do we avoid this sort of siloing and work together to solve the larger scale issues. Um, and then we spent a lot of time in this last panel talking about the multi-sector partnerships. And I think they spent a lot of time talking about the different incentives. I like the impedance mismatch. Um, the IP issues didn't come up, but I just wanna end with a point that I think was repeatedly emphasized, which is that these are hard and that one needs to think about them so that you do it in a, it, you do it thoughtfully. And I like Matthew's point about that you spend the time on creating the partnerships that are of value that you can do quickly it's going to take you three years to set up the partnership, then that's perhaps not one that's going to be of value, at least in the short term. And I think it's now Brad's slide next. Okay, just a few thoughts here. Uh, Scott's willingness to play. Clearly, there are a lot of people who want to play, and that's got to be good and beneficial. Lots going on. Uh, it's exciting. My second poll there. It, it's an exciting day. It was exciting to hear all that's going on, both in federal and private industry. And a lot's going on. No doubt, we're going to see amazing things over these years to come. It's going to be very exciting. Uh, my traditional common sense, looking back, it's not going to do everything for everyone. So we have to be smart and figure out where it's going to, to pay in. When all the years, I always go out and talk about numeric weather prediction, weather forecasting. We talk about gaining a day or two in our weather forecast skill every decade, you know, we say, ah, oh, there's no silver bullet. But, you know, one has to wonder, you know, maybe there's some silver bullet stuff going on here and it's just exciting. Uh, I, I do feel that it's really early. There's a lot of stuff going on. We don't really know Amy's trend line. Where does it go? Where does it level off? How do these different techniques apply? So I don't think we have sufficient knowledge to really drive federal agencies, particularly that maintain operational systems to make expensive pivoting decisions. We're just not there. I think that we, they, federal government, federal sector has to be there. They have to be players, but let's go with a lot. Of, and this is where it really, and all three of us hit on partnerships. It really, we have to drive those partnerships. There's so much that each sector can bring to this that we need each piece there. We need the the nimble private sector that can bring in and do the, we can't build, re, you know, rebuild infrastructure. We have to everyone there. So partnerships is a really take, big takeaway here. And that just drives in and highlights the importance of open data, open science, as you build those public private uh, relationships. But I thought it's late in the afternoon. And this afternoon when I was sitting over there taking my notes, I thought, oh, well, how can we end in I thought, okay, I'll just ask chat a GPT. So why don't we go to the next slide? And I said, will all weather forecasting be done by AI ML by 2035? Maybe that's too long. You know, I'm still probably in the slow mode of weather forecasting. I found it a little bit interesting. It, I got it, chat GPT agrees it's a, there'll be a significant role. And then it kind of takes a really safe position. Well, they're already adding value right now. so there'll probably be more value by 2035. I, I thought a couple of interesting other things that came up with is it depends on various factors. It mentions technology and data availability. Clearly data is a critical factor that we saw throughout the day today, but it also brought in preferences of meteorological organizations. So we still have a say in this. 
there's still there's still a choice, right? And, and how do we drive? Which way do we go? So I threw that in there. And as someone who spent a lot of time in the weather forecasting part of it, I can go all the way back to the first numerical weather prediction in, in 1950, when Norm Phillips said, well, we'll no longer need weather forecasters. You know, the, the human will be out of the loop. We'll, we'll do it all with numerical weather prediction. Chat GPT says, even in 2035, human expertise and judgment are remain essential to interpreting things. So human forecasters have survived a hundred years. So anyway, that's what Jack, Chat GPT had to say with it. So Mary, do I hand it back to you? You do. Um, I have to say, we're going to give AI the last word on this session. <laughs> I really want to thank you guys for uh, all our panelists and for our organizers for this afternoon. It was great.